what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to we're going to begin to introduce the more data science-y aspect of this course. And this course is not going to be mostly about data science stuff, but there's a couple of core applications that I want you to be aware of. And it'll also be kind of a gentle introduction into deep learning stuff because we're going to start to use, um, we're going to start to use like uh, deep learning frameworks in, in the next couple of weeks, like using TensorFlow and Keras. And we're not usually going to be coding them. We're just going to be using command line tools, but it's good to kind of like see the innards so that you're kind of, that you feel like it's accessible, you can read the code a little bit and understand what's going on. Um, we've actually learned enough for you to be able to read basic Keras code, which is, which is really cool, and that's why we're actually going to do something like that today. The other thing we'll do, uh, and this will be the second half of today, is kind of just go through and finish the, all of the real-time frameworks that we've introduced, or at least finish to the extent that, uh, like, demonstrating them. So that'll be all of our JavaScript demos, our ML5 demos, uh, and also the ML4A open frameworks demos and also I'm gonna do some Wackinator stuff depending on how much time we have and um, The goal is to, is that so you uh, see the landscape of all the tools that you have at your disposal um, And we're gonna be doing these projects. So that's gonna be I'm gonna talk about that in a moment um, So this is gonna be kind of uh, gearing up for that basically um, Okay, just a few announcements before we start uh, I'll talk about AI Lab. So we're going to have, so as you know, we've had this AI Lab a couple of, uh, we've had it twice now, trying to get this kind of like meet up off the ground. We're going to have a very special guest this Friday, and it's going to be at 4.30 p.m. rather than 5, which is the usual time. And our guest is Memo Acton, so maybe a lot of, some of you may know him. He's quite well known around these parts. Um, I showed his work in the first week, so this is kind of doing some picks to pick stuff. If you haven't seen him talk, he's a really, really like uh, interesting, entertaining person, um, and he's he's coming all the way here for, for the for AI Lab. Yeah, don't ask him if that's true. It's very com completely verified. It's <laughs> um, and also uh, office hours. Okay, so I'm gonna set up the Google Calendar thing later today, and I'll send you the link. But basically, tomorrow I'll I'll be available one to seven, let's say. Um, roughly those times so just email me ahead of time and we'll, we'll kind of get you sorted in I'll be downstairs and um, and I'll be here on Thursday and Friday too so that's just kind of to be aware of um, just note that uh, next week I'm gonna be out of town and I'm gonna talk about the schedule in the next slide but I'll be out of town next week so I won't be here for office hours but I'll still be available over email and things like that I'll come back in the middle of the following week um, so we're so so yeah just to, to be aware of that um, Okay, let me just give you like a rough outline of the next four weeks uh, because this is going to be kind of like closing the first module of this class. So today, like again, as we said, I'm going to introduce, uh, we're going to talk about feature extraction and uh, TensorFlow and Keras and uh, applications as uh, associated with that. And then next week, we're, we're actually not scheduled to meet. Uh, but we, as I mentioned last week, we, uh, Chris and Alejandro are going to do a uh, a session on, on runway. I'll send an email about this at some point, but basically they're going to give you a tutorial of their beta in progress of runway. For those who haven't seen runway yet, it's, it's possibly going to be like uh, really your best friend uh, as a tool for creating projects in this course and especially the next version of it. They still haven't finished like a proper release of it yet which means that we can't exactly use it, but what they've uh, said is that they're going to show you how it works so that, and possibly distribute some sort of an alpha version of the beta, let's call it. And um, once you have that, uh, you'll be able to actually, uh, you know, set up some of these really cool deep learning pipelines. Um, so it's, you know, it's, you can consider it optional because, because technically we're not meeting next week, but um, you'll definitely make me very happy if you, if you go see their tutorial, because again, these are gonna be like the best tools you could possibly learn, like for, in the spirit of this class. Um, and the week after that, we don't have class also because it's it's kind of a weird like Monday schedule for that Tuesday. So we just don't have class scheduled. And I'm going to be out of town that day anyway. But I'm coming back uh, like later in that week, like on Thursday, I'll be back. Um, okay, so this is the idea for the week that, that I'll be back. So I, I'm this is my last class here for the like for the next three weeks. Like the next time I'll be back here is in three weeks. So, which is October 16th. And what we want to do that day is have, I'm thinking to have like mini presentations. So this is going to be kind of like a midterm project. What I'd like for you to do, you have three weeks to create some sort of a basic 
uh, application that uses the tools that we've shown so, uh, so far today, which I'm going to summarize again today. Um, you know, your, your ML5, your, your Open Frameworks demos, uh, which should work easily in everyone's computer, and then also um, uh, Wackinator if you choose to use it. And the idea is not necessarily to go to go wild and make you know like your your final project, but to do something that's like uh, represents a clever hack of something that we've shown using one of the uh, included uh, examples, let's say as a template. Uh, so it should be pretty fairly you know accessible, something that everyone should be able to do. And what I'd like to do is basically. Um, uh, yeah, what, what we'll do is kind of like, here's, here's the way that we'll kind of structure it. On the 16th, what I'd like to do, let's see how it goes, but I'd like to devote the first half of that course or maybe uh, half of that class to mini presentations. We don't want to make like a, a crazy thing, like, like our final presentations will be, let's say, the whole class. But for this, let's just do like show, show what you have, show the idea, maybe talk about what you struggled with maybe. Uh, or if you created any um, reusable tools in the process of making it and just um, you know kind of talk about it for between three and five minutes and I should say it's it's optional so like if you want to instead just show it to me and not have it in the class you're you're completely welcome to do that uh, but everyone should have a project so that's that's going to be the goal um, and and yeah so that's that's going to be kind of the style of the way things go and since we have, uh, since that should hopefully only take the first half of the class, then we can also devote the second half of the class to beginning the next module, which is kind of more generative applications. And um, we'll see how much time there is for that. Like it, it might just be a casual introduction and we'll start in earnest the following week. Uh, but hopefully we can kind of get started on that. And yeah, um, these are the tools that are available to you. And if you, you, you can go off the board also and use let's say runway if you want to or like the uh, ml4a guides which which we have which we're going to introduce today um feel free to bring in whatever you want maybe somebody might get interested in in a framework that we haven't talked about um, that's completely also um, very much uh, welcome and even encouraged okay so the deep learning frameworks that um, have proliferated in the last couple of years uh, you're looking at a few of them and we're going to mostly focus on um, Keras and TensorFlow today. And again, we're going to approach it at a relatively high level. Like we're not going to look at TensorFlow code today exactly. We're going to look at Keras code. And Keras is kind of the processing of TensorFlow, let's say. And, um, but just to be aware of some of the other frameworks that are out there, the other big one is PyTorch. And PyTorch and TensorFlow are kind of like frenemies, let's say, like competitors. People use them for different purposes. Um, there's a really big community around both of them and and some of the stuff we'll use is actually PyTorch based but again we're not going to actually this class is not about learning how to code TensorFlow or PyTorch which is relatively well beyond the scope of this class anyway um, but you should be able to kind of get going with Keras and then some of the other ones that we might see are CAFE um, and and we're, I haven't worked with MXNet so I, I don't actually think we'll uh, see that in this class. Theano is basically discontinued, so that project is quickly, uh, it's been replaced by TensorFlow, more or less, and so we probably won't see too much of that either. And then this one is a little bit off the board, <laughs> Darknet, for those of you who are, um, who have been using the Open Frameworks demos, there's this uh, C++-based library called Darknet, which is being implemented by this one madman, who's at the University of Washington, I think. Um, and um, it's, it's a really funny, like, it's called Darknet for whatever reason, and it's got a really weird cryptic logo and so on. I'll kind of show that probably another week, I think. But it does, like, for example, when we use the object detection, that's using Darknet. And, and uh, Chris and Alejandro will show you object, object detection because that's one of the modules in Runway. Okay, just to give you an understanding of how these things are kind of structured. So people here are pretty familiar with the idea of processing being an abstraction of Java, which makes doing things that are particularly relevant to artists, designers, and you know, creative professionals and so on. Um, it, it, in Java, it makes those things um, easier, basically, more accessible, a little bit more high level. It's basically like a wrapper to Java graphics libraries and sound libraries and so on. And ML5 is kind of the same thing to TensorFlow.js, right? So ML5 abstracts a lot of the low-level detail inside of TensorFlow.js and gives you kind of nice reusable modules that you can use to do, let's say, image classification or regression or whatever you need. 
Um, Keras is the same thing for TensorFlow. So let me just back up, like what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is a uh, library that has been being actively developed for a number of years by Google. It's an open source project, and so in theory it's, it's available to anyone, but it's particularly associated with Google. It started as an internal project at Google and was released in early 2016. And what TensorFlow does is it kind of, uh, it's not explicitly for deep learning. The scope of TensorFlow's library is much more low level than that. It's the point of TensorFlow is to set up gigantic computational graphs in a way that is computationally efficient, um, which means that you know these neural networks that we're building, they consume so many resources. And so efficiency um, and, and, and kind of implementing that in the, in the most um, well, in the, in the most performant possible way is a really big concern in the deep learning community. And so this library kind of takes care of all of the low level detail, allocation of memory resources, like setting up, setting up these, um, uh, these deep learning pipelines. And it also has automatic differentiation in, inside of it, which means it calculates gradients. Basically it does all of that so we, you don't have to code it. In the old days, <laughs> um, the, all that stuff used to be like just like you know libraries that you could download, and then you'd have to figure out how to use them and so on. Uh, but now it's been abstracted away quite nicely. And what Keras does is it, if you look at TensorFlow code, it doesn't necessarily, it might still look like gibberish to you, but Keras kind of wraps that in the way that processing wraps Java, and um, and kind of makes writing neural networks easy to read. So you know net equals new model net dot add layer net dot add layer net dot add layer net dot train things like that um, just to put it in pseudocode and so uh, Keras uh, tends to be preferred uh, by let's say engineers especially engineers at like um, companies that don't necessarily specialize in research um, and so I've used it as the basis for all of my guides like on ML phrase guides because for just that reason um, and so we'll be kind of, and of course, yeah, it's the tip of the iceberg, right? That's the point of this metaphor. So we'll be showing that um, in just a bit. Um, the primary, or at least the first thing that I'm gonna show you is this concept of reverse image search. So um, the task goes like this. If you, you have a query image and you want to retrieve the K nearest neighbors to that image, from a large data set of images, right? So like you have a frog or a bullfrog or whatever, a toad, I'm not sure. Who knows what that is? Who knows what species that is? Well, any, anyhow, um, this retrieves a bunch of other images of frogs, right? And what's cool is that notice that a lot of them vary considerably in color detail, right? So it's not retrieving something that has a similar pixel color distribution. It actually retrieves to you, uh, retrieves you uh, images which have similar content, right? Which is to say that it retrieves frogs. Um, and, you know, if you've ever used Google Images reverse image search, you know that it does the same thing. And it basically uses the, the kind of technique we're gonna show today, where it uses something like that under the hood. And so we're just going to be kind of uh, making a DIY version of it, or at least I'll be showing you a DIY version of it. Now, it may sound like a very specific particular task, but it's actually, kind of the wellspring of many higher order tasks. So when we do, uh, for example, we'll do later today TSNI, and actually I think I have, that's, that might be in the next slide. I have a few slides for now, but we'll show like TSNI when we do this data visualization stuff. Um, it really kind of is, is not too different from, from reverse image search because it starts with this idea of feature extraction, that every image can be represented by a feature vector, right? Um, so what's a feature vector, right? So let's say you have an image of a car and you convert it into a feature vector. And the feature vector is just a vector of numbers which, dis which describes that image in some sense. Now, what do we mean by describe it, right? We, we, when we did the demos, right, we showed these convolutional neural network demos, we saw that a uh, neural network can uh, basically uh, give us a representation of a data point where all of the elements in that representation are uh, associated with some sort of high level feature and high level feature might be things like wheels or faces right or windows or doors right and and, and some of them might be much less interpretable right they're not written anywhere they're just kind of like something that we can observe and so 
using the neural network that we showed last week in the demo, or the two weeks ago, the convolutional network, you would get a representation of an image that looks kind of like this down here at the bottom. Oops. Um, and uh, the idea is that two images of trucks are probably going to be very highly correlated in their feature vectors. Um, and, yeah? Sorry, just to clarify, that image at the bottom is all of the features and the activation planes for those features? It, it's, it's just the, the activations in the very last uh, layer of the network, or second to last layer. So per, like level the most high level that the network has, right? Actually, the second most high level, because the most high level would be the, the actual classification. But we, we um, uh, you'll see this in the, when we explore the notebook, we actually chop that layer off because it's a little too high level. Um, and, and I'll describe why when we, when we get to that notebook, yeah? So when, when like, a person looks at this, they might think, like, oh, pick up truck with four wheels, uh, big tires, or whatever. Um, is there any way to uh, to sort of allow the, um, the neural network to sort of hone in on specific ways? Because we see features, I'm assuming, differently than the way that the neural network is interpreting it. They might be looking at, like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you, in order to do a query like that, you would have to have probably, at least the first way I can think to do something like that is you would have had to have trained it in order to identify the features that you're in particularly concerned about. Um, so if you, if you do want color, that could be actually a secondary label that you use, and then it would learn features that are specifically relevant to that, and then later you could do query results like that. But here, this is based on um, it, it, it. There is no there is no explicit features guaranteed. It's trained in order to maximize classification accuracy. So it probably the label is probably trucks or pickup trucks or whatever. And so it learns features that are, you know, very coarse but basically relevant ju just to that. Um, but in, in theory, there's a way to do that kind of more advanced querying. But we'll, we're going to start with the sort of lowest level, uh, or l let's say the simplest. Approach. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Anybody? Anybody else? All right. So um, another way to think about this is that we are embedding our data points into space, into some sort of a feature space, right? So you're going to hear this word a lot as well if you're interested in the machine learning space. Embedding, right? You kind of hear embedding a lot. And um, what do I mean by that, right? So any image will give us a feature vector. And in this case, in, for this neural network, it happens to be 4,096 numbers. So you can think of that point as a, uh, you can think of that image as being embedded as a point inside of a 4,096 dimensional space. That 4,096 dimensional space contains all of the possible combinations of these activations that you can possibly have, right? In other words, any image would be a point in that 4,096 dimensional space. Does that make sense? I know it starts to get a little abstract, but it's a, it, it, it does help to think of it this way. So that means that if you have a data set, let's say you have five, five points, then um, all of those things, you can extract their features and put them inside that space. So let's say you just have a two-dimensional space like this, and you have these points A, B, C, D, and E. Now, the, the, the reason why it's useful to think of it this way is because um, it has some, it, it preserves basic geometric properties, right, that we're familiar with. So, for example, you notice that B and E are very close to each other, right? So, B and E are closer to each other than B and C. And that should, that, what that indicates is that B and E must be more similar because they, well, they lie closer to each other in feature space, right? And, um, and you'll you'll see that in the the next the first three applications that I show you will all will all can will all be applications exploiting that property. Yeah. Is this um, idea of like the two dimensions like embedding in a two dimensional um, space of similarity is that what a t is or is a t something other? Uh, it is. Yeah. I mean, when when you, and we're gonna do t later today, so I'll say I'll save the longer explanation for that. But yes, t embeds in a two-dimensional space, and it does so in a, in a particular way. There's multiple ways of embedding um, points into, uh, into feature space. t is kind of the one that's preferred for, uh, for two and three dimensions for visualization, because, because it, 
happens to have certain properties that are very good for that, um, whereas other techniques may not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't. You can't avoid it because you absolutely will lose information. But there are ways of trying to lose as little information as possible, and and that's also something that is in a couple of slides. Like I have slides on principal component analysis, which is all about doing exactly that, and that's that'll yeah we'll follow up to that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Another cool uh, property of these is that. And this isn't always um, this isn't always useful, but in certain use cases it is. Like for example, with word vectors, sometimes the vectors that uh, connect uh, two different points actually have interpretable meaning as well. So um, I actually this will be more clear. Um, yeah, I think when we have yeah, I'll show I'll show an example of this a little little later. But like let's say a, a feature a vector that let's say adds or subtracts certain features. Can be um, can also have some sort of interpretation. I have a better explanation of this when we when we show word vectors. So let's like keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so like uh, just a really quick review. What these first three weeks have been all about is extracting feature vectors, right? So we learned about neural networks, and we saw that neural networks can extract uh, activation activations and therefore feature vectors for any set of images. It uh, so like for numbers, let's say. The, there's sometimes, be careful not to confuse the activations and the weights, right? The weights are a property of the neural network that is used to, you know, create the mapping between the media, let's say, like the raw input and the features that it finds. And then the activations are the features. So, you know, act, like, or let's say, just, to, just so that I'm not confusing you too much, like features are from the activations. They're patterns in the activations, right? And the activations are these neurons, right? They're, they're the values carried inside of the neurons. Uh, we learned that this process, last week we talked about how this is uh, discovered. So we um, were able to train a neural network using an iterative process called gradient descent. <clears throat> and uh, gradient descent basically is this iterative process that starts with a random parameterization and then finds the, or not the, but a good one. Not the best one, but a good one, because it's impossible to guarantee finding the best one. Um, so, and, and of course, now this, this visual on the right here is what happens, what it looks like when you apply gradient descent to a two-dimensional linear regression, which means you have this very conveniently bowl-shaped loss function, which means that you're going to get to the bottom of it. But in reality, loss functions for nonlinear functions like neural networks tend to be very irregular, very non-convex as we call them. And so there's all kinds of problems that, that uh, result when you try to train it with gradient descent, which is to say that you get stuck inside of uh, you know, local minima, right? Like lo lo local optimal parameterizations, but not necessarily the best ones. And so we, have a, we learned a whole big bag of tricks that uh, you know, research scientists use to try to get around this problem. And this is kind of the major focus, I would say the primary focus of research in, in the area of machine learning is figuring out how to train better and more accurately. And so uh, we talked about mini batch and stochastic gradient descent as a, as a means of, of dealing with this problem. We talked about different optimizers like momentum and, and at, uh, adaptive uh, adaptive functions. We talked about regularization. Now, all of these are kind of jargon, a little jargony for, for the scope of this class. But when we look at Keras, you're going to see these, uh, see these words pop up. And so if you have at least a, a basic understanding of what they are, you can at least kind of continue and know what they're there for. And you know, if you kind of keep looking at it, you'll slowly learn what all, in more specificity what all these things do. Um, but just be, be aware of them at the very least. You don't necessarily have to be a scholar about them, but, but kind of uh, keep them, keep a glossary, like a mental glossary of what these things mean. So this is what training looks like. So again, with something that we learned, you get this feature representation in the one layer neural network, you get features that look like the image classes themselves. In, and, and in a multiple layer neural network, you get of course, much more abstract features. And what you get is this sort of hierarchy of features, where in the early layers of the network, you get very simple features. So in the very first layer, you could say the input layer, your features are nothing but the bare pixels themselves, right? 
and then in the first the next the first after the first convolution you have let's say basic edges or simple really really simple multiple pixel patterns and then as you proceed through the network the features that you get the activations become progressively more and more high level uh, more and more complicated they go from things like corners and parallel lines to to uh, like basic like polygons and uh, then into basic objects basic object categories let's say windows doors you know um, ears faces computer screens and then eventually to your classification layer and um, and we're particularly concerned by the most high level uh, activations because those are the ones we're really interested in right if we want more frogs frog is going to be a high level activation right or sorry a high one of the high level features uh, or a classification itself um, now how do we how do we tell how similar two images are so if I ask you like which of these two images are more similar which of these two image pairs are more similar to each other probably everyone's thinking well maybe not everyone but like the cat and the dog are roughly more similar than the cat cat and the truck how do we actually calculate that right um, we extract all their features and we grab the very the last layer activations and then uh, and then so we have these activations right so what, what can we do to compare you know the, uh, to, to compute some sort of a similarity metric or a dissimilarity metric like a, you know a dissimilarity metric is kind of what we're looking for so the the simple thing to do would be to take the distance between them right either the distance or the correlation right which are just measures of how similar or dissimilar two vectors are now it turns out um, for uh, for like somewhat mathy reasons that you can't quite do this like it makes sense theoretically but it turns out to have uh, that if you just did that it would have uh, it wouldn't work too well and the reason has to do with the fact that when you have a very high dimension high dimensionality um, all distance measurements kind of go to crap like uh, because the space is kind of too large that one reason for that is is that the actual feature vectors are very very redundant so a lot of uh, or, or redundant in the sense that many of the elements in them are actually highly correlated with each other so for example one two two of the neurons might both be looking for faces or might be looking for slightly different shaped faces or something like that and so they're going to be very highly correlated whenever it sees a face they'll both be active and so there's a ton of redundancy in other words, like and more, and more mathematically, none of the, the these feature vectors are not necessarily linearly independent. They're highly, highly uh, correlated with each other, which means that some features may may give undue uh, weight into the uh, into the calculation of the distance uh, more than others. You know, especially more than uh, some of the like more meaningful detailed ones. So it turns out these measurements don't do so well. But what does do well is when we try to, uh, yeah, convert these. So the solution to this problem is to is to use dimensionality reduction, which is that usually we're not working with the 4,096 dimensional feature vectors. We're going to reduce them into a smaller uh, feature vector, which uh, which has two properties, um, two major properties. One is that it the the representation of your data set preserves all of as much of all of the original geometry as possible. In other words, two points that are similar in 4096 dimensions or close to each other in 4096 dimensions are close to each other in 100 dimensions or 200 dimensions or whatever it is. Um, so that's that's the goal. Um, and then the second property is that all of the, uh, the, the elements in the reduced space are actually like as linearly independent of each other as possible non-correlated mutually orthogonal for anyone who has like a math background so these things might make some sense um and so that and that's going to be usually like a sort of pre-processing step when you do google reverse image search the feature vectors they use i think are are i forget uh because someone told me at some point but they're it's really small it's like it's like two digits i don't know it's like 64 numbers or something like that um, even though there's actually a lot more information uh, which comes out of a you know a convolutional network. Um, any questions? I know there was a lot. Yeah? So we were talking about PCA before. Yeah, that's one way of doing it, and we'll show that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, images embedded in the feature space, you know, might look something like this. And so two images of dogs ought to be very close to each other and ought to be relatively close to the image of a cat. And the image of a you know car and the image of a house are relatively far apart from the others, right? This is kind of the properties that we're hoping to have. Because once you have this property, then you can do all sorts of higher level tasks. So reverse image search is one of them. Visualization like TSNI is another one. We're going to show this like shortest path between images, which is yet another one. Um, that's going to be one of the other examples we show. Uh, it's not just images you can embed. You can embed anything that you can extract a feature vector from. So sounds. Um, and that's we're also going to do that today. Um, words, we're, we're probably not going to do this, but I might show you a few examples of this. So if you're familiar with word vectors, and actually ML5 has a word vector example, so that's also, um, so for those of you who are interested in it, you can use that. Um, word vectors embed words into a feature space, right? And um, which is really weird, right? Like, because, you know, words, how do you even represent them as numbers? And um, yeah, that's, we, I'm thinking possibly to devote one entire lecture to this, like later in the semester. I haven't decided yet, but but at some point I'll return to word vectors. In any case, like one of the cool things that about word vectors that you maybe have seen before, because this made a lot of noise when it kind of first appeared on the scene, word to vec and so on, is that um, not only are the um, you know like words kind of that are similar to each other in some sense appear close to each other but the vectors actually have um, like like interpretable meaning so the vector that that goes from woman to man is roughly the same as the vector that goes from queen to king so that you'll see that in a lot of word vector uh, data sets and it's is what is it it's like a gender a gender vector right and um, and and there's all sorts of examples of this like uh, country capitals for example uh, parts of speech uh, changing things like that actually I have a slide on this in a second um, here's a nice little toss-up. Where would the word duchess be, right? So queen and duke are near each other, right? Because they're both like royalty terms, I guess. Um, where where would duchess be, right? Well, it should be up here, right? Because the vector will be roughly like the female to, to male vector will be roughly like like parallel to the others. Um, yeah, these are these are all a bunch of examples of of, of uh, you know these these kinds of relationships. So there's the typical one to show is the gender gender vector. There's also like verb tense, so swimming and swam, walking and walked. Um, but then there's really cool like high level ones like country capitals. So Spain is to Madrid as Italy is to Rome, right? So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, you'll see a lot of this kind of stuff in word vector. Uh, and just, just remember, it's not usually in 3D. It's usually like your word vectors are a few hundred dimensions, right? So otherwise it'd be very hard to capture that fine grain of a relationship vector, but in very high in very high dimensions, there's a lot of ways that a vector can go. And so it's possible to kind of have a lot of these kinds of relationships preserved. Uh, Aiden, did you have a question? Uh, oh, that was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just remember that these are all simplifications. It's usually high, much, many more high dimensions. Um, if you're wondering like how to visualize things in, you know, 15D or 100D or 1000D, the trick is, like like if you're trying to visualize something in 20 dimensions, um, visualize it in two or three dimensions and just say 20. That's what everyone does. It's okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a quote from Jeff Jeffrey Hinton, um, which I found quite quite funny. What would be dimensions for word to text? Like the the what do you mean? The dimensions, like each dimension, would be like uh, similarity between words or each dimension. Or? Like what each dimension of the feature? Well, it's kind of abstract. So like one dimension may not necessarily be highly interpretable. It might be, you know, like there might be. It's just like with the images. Like one of those elements in that feature vector might capture some, uh, like something that you can observe about a bunch of words that that looks like it makes sense. Like maybe. Uh, maybe there's a royalty element, you know, so like things on one scale of the element, you know, like king, queen, king, queen prince, duke, uh, maybe, but usually it's much more abstract, like the actual features lie along many dimensions. Yeah? Can we see the, the, the king, queen, duke discussion? Yeah, yeah. So um, right now, not, it's not drawn, but technically there's a, there's a, a vector that goes from woman to queen. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that, that vector should also be the same as the one from woman to, to duchess, as would be the, the same vector between 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, this is not exactly drawn to scale. So right, right. The, yeah, 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 yeah. But, like, but yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like woman to duchess should be roughly the same as man to duke, and actually it roughly is. Um, right, man to duke, woman to duchess. But yeah, you, you there. So exactly. That's that's the that's the make someone a duke vector. Um, let's call it. Um, uh, this is another really cool thing is that like um, you can you know word word to vec is kind of gets all of the all of the press because it kind of came first, but you can embed entire sentences and paragraphs into space, and this starts to get really abstract because words. You know, you think of words, w words are units, right? So like we have a limited number of words, right? But sentences are, are infinite, right? You can create any number of sentences. And so the fact that you can embed sentences in the space should really mess with your head a little bit. It's almost like the space in which you embed sentences is, a, is the space of all possible sentences, right? Uh, well, it can't be the space of all possible sentences because of course that's infinite because of recursion, but like, uh, how does that work? Actually, no. It, it, well, okay. Technically, it's just the space of all possible embeddings, and then, of course, like two sentences may have the same embedding. So, it's the it's the space of all possible sentence embeddings in one in one space. And you can think of a sentence embedding as capturing meaning, right? Like just like words capture meaning about a particular element in the word space, then a sentence, you know, imbued inside of one of these. Like not imbued, embedded in one of these um, sentence spaces, it has many of the same properties. Except any sentence can go into it, including ones that no one has ever said before. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It's like a like a conceptual fabric of all the possible like thoughts that you can have. Yeah. It's kind of a separate thing, although although usually the way that they're calculated, and maybe again we'll have part of a lecture devoted to this, they do actually uh, learn word vectors along the way, because you have to the sentence has to be represented, you know, like the the words themselves have to be represented by vectors, so uh, in order to like because words you know by themselves are not numbers, you can't you'll, you can't do anything with them, so there's usually like a word vector um, along the way, but they're usually trained for um, like for not word level tasks, but sentence level tasks. And so they're usually kind of discovered in a different way than the word vectors themselves. Uh, the word vectors are often um, like trained implicitly um, to, the, to the sentence specific task. Yeah, that's... So you can't do things that like subtract a word vector from a sentence vector and end up with like a semantically meaningful No, no, not, at least not any way that I can think of, yeah. Um, you you can subtract vec like sentence vectors from you know so like this this I suppose should roughly be true like the hardware store is in Queens where is the hardware store the mouse ate the cheese what did the mouse eat so like question inversion uh, vector might exist right and then also like the mouse ate the cheese and Carla ate some bread denotes some sort of a you know like organism <laughs> ate thing so they might be similar to each other. One thing about well, like word vector similarity is that um, we often interpret it uh, not exactly correctly. Like word vectors, um, the the way that similarity works with okay in images it kind of makes sense because it goes okay like two different breeds of dogs are similar because they're both dogs, but in word vectors for example he and she might have om uh, very sim almost the same embedding, and even though they're like th in theory they're opposites. Right, he and she are opposites, so you'd think they should be on opposite ends of the space, but they're actually in the same place, and that's because the similarity is more of a contextual similarity. He and she uh, appear in the same part of sentences all the time, and and the way that word vectors are usually trained is for things like next word prediction. That's some, something like that. Um, so that's why you get that, that kind of similarity. If it's if it's trained to some other task, then you might get other kinds of similarities, but usually it's some sort of a contextual similarity. Did you have a question? Yeah, it was sort of more about the training. Like in this case, we're visualizing similarity, but what is this classification? What is this actually classifying? What are we training? On? Yeah, like um, so again, like it is beyond the scope of the class, but I'll just I'll answer that briefly. Like usually, the way word vectors are trained is they're trained in or uh, they're trained in such a way that it's like a neural network 
predicting the next word in a, in a sequence of words. So maybe your input is the last five word vectors, and then your output is the you know the next word vector, right. something like that. You can um, kind of repurpose those features to like look at the similarity, even though it's yeah, not really right, right, yeah. or or some other NL, like natural language processing task. It might right. be it, it might be like sentiment uh, like sentiment detection. The, the point is it actually doesn't even matter. That's the funny thing. Like actually, if anyone's interested in this topic, um, they should watch, there's a really great class on natural language processing and deep learning by, taught by Richard Socher. It's CS2, it's a, let's see if I can, CS, uh, what is it, 2024? I might have the number wrong, but if you look up like Richard Socher, Stanford, um, computer science, like natural language processing, you'll find this class on YouTube. And yeah, it, it um, as long as it's trained to some relatively meaningful like natural language processing task, it'll learn a decent set of word vectors. But the same thing goes uh, for images, but like and for like frames. Like if we train it to classify something, we can analyze similarities. Exactly. Yeah, and and and, and actually, that's an, a good analogy. Like in with images, it doesn't really matter what you, like as long as it doesn't matter what your your um, like categories are. Right. It'll learn usually roughly the same features because you know. T features tend to be kind of universal, at least low-level ones. Mm -hmm. um, or, or, yeah? Um, do machine learning scientists have um, any sort of like theoretical framework for ascribing meaning to high-level feature vectors? Or is it usually always just kind of an experiment plus of like, oh, if I subtract this, it, does, it has this effect? Well, I'm not, uh, can you clarify what you mean? Like, uh, yeah, they, yeah. so they don't necessarily assign meaning explicitly. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of something that we talk about. You know, <laughs> it's a little yeah. fuzzy. Well, I feel like yeah. I see an example Right. Yeah. We're going to have uh, probably the next time I'm here, like the beginning of the generative art module, we'll, we'll start with, with questions that are related to that because you can do experiments to figure out what the features are. Um, now, and now when I say figure out, it's like, again, it's not explicitly anywhere inside the neural network. It's just something that like, if you see that one feature tends to respond all the time for faces, then you'll go, oh, that's the face vector. And so probably, I'm not sure about the, with the Magenta example how that's actually done, um, but, but I'm, I can almost guess that uh, unless it was trained specifically on, on something like note density, then it's probably just something that they found. And then, you know, once you find it, there are like varieties of neural networks that, that try to actually like um, specifically add constraints in the training process in order to... Um, capture desired kinds of uh, features. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit when we look into GANs, um, which is later in the semester. So it's a very fuzzy, very fuzzy space, I would say. Um, good questions, though. Any, any others? OK, good. keep them coming. Um, let's just see how we're doing in time. Yeah, um, one, one, we started at 12.10. OK, cool. Um, this should roughly take us to, to the break and then we'll do the practical. So uh, things like this start to make sense, right? We, we sh I showed this slide in the first week. So a woman is eating a delicious sandwich and a neural network produces an image, right? Well, now you can actually see how this would work as, in, um, as a neural network, right? You, n not this neural network because this only has two input neurons, right? But you can embed a sentence as a vector in a sentence space. Um, and you know, the, the, and just remember, like the number of elements is fixed, right? So you can have a neural network whose input is the embedding of that particular sentence, and then the output might be a whole bunch of pixels. So, um, and again, like this is a little bit more of a hint of later in the semester when we get into generative models. But, but I just wanted to bring this up so now you can kind of like, yeah, we'll keep on back propagating our understanding of this. So like, you know, next time, the next time we look at it, you're going to understand it a little bit more and then we'll look at it again and you'll, we're going to fine tune those, those parameters in your brains. Um, yeah. So this, um, when, so this image is created like from like scratch mm -hmm. essentially. And the way that this, this algorithm does it is it's taking, um, it's assigning a RGB value to each pixel. Um, and, and that's based off of other images that it's 
who's been trained on that, that show I know women and sandwiches and delicious things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, and there may not be any, any any actual training sample that contains that exact sentence or a woman eating a sandwich, but maybe there's sandwiches and there's women and there's things that are delicious, and so it learns all of those things and kind of learns a uh, learns a mapping from from one to the other. Yeah, it's kind of weird, right? Yeah. Uh, this is actually just from I think yesterday, or at least I saw it yesterday. Or if anything, it's from like uh, it might be a month old or something. But this is some research from Facebook, uh, Facebook AI, that uh, is like the best neural story generation I've ever seen. Like, and, and you know, for those of you who are watching the Char RNNs, you know, like um, coming up with science fiction scripts and you know, like uh, Seinfeld episodes and things like that, and they always don't make any sense. Like when you read them for too long like read these and just try to believe that this was this was completely written by a neural network right so the, and this is using a sort of prompt so like the neural network is given a prompt and then it has to produce a whole paragraph on that prompt so it writes the scientist stood there a little dazed as he stared what is it he asked this this thing this is a virus a chemical that can destroy an entire planet and it is a very small complex chemical that could destroy any planet, the scientist replied. His lab assistant looked down at the tablet. I've just discovered it. I can't believe it. It looks like it's made of some sort of chemical that's very dangerous. Well, that's a virus on the ground. It's, a, it's very effective. I can't believe what it is, he said, pointing to the scientist. We don't know what this thing is. We haven't seen anything like it. We can't even see anything like this. Dr. Jones stared at the scientist for a moment. What do you mean, what does it do? It, it's a monster. <laughs> this is, it, like... So, you know, the, the big problem with all these, like, uh, RNN, chat RNN type bots is that, you know, you read them for long enough and they just, like, lose memory and they start talking about random things and, you know, there's all we have. And that's usually, like, the whole, like, l- literally every time one of these char RNNs is in, is in the press, like, that's the funny thing about them is that they forget. It's, like, the same joke over and over. Like, okay, it has a recipe, it lists some ingredients, and then it starts cooking with different, different ingredients and things like that. Um, but now it's like, now they're starting to get actually like pretty good. And the, I don't think they released the model, but the, both the code and the data set, the data set is something like, I think a few hundred thousand writing prompts. So there's some sort of a Reddit, um, Reddit group where I, uh, like, and it's, it's here. I just discovered this today. So I don't know exactly if anyone knows this better, like jump in, but people like, it's like a creative writing group where people post prompts. Like prompt, uh, like write about this, and then people write little short stories. So people scraped this for like hundreds of thousands of these, and, and wrote and wrote a neural network that does the same thing. The the, the great the next thing is of course the Turing test. Like put them on, put these on Reddit and see if people can figure out if it's a machine. Um, Aiden, do you have a question? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, so that's that's pretty awesome, right? And and of course like. What is what, what is the future of this, right? If it's going to – look how good it's getting, right? It's like it, we can write it, – it's, it's very likely, I would say, um, let's say within 10 years that most of our news – and not editorials but like news is being written by things like this that just summarize ticker tape, you know, of news. And that's – and you, you can already see the seeds of that, right? Did anyone read the um, – read that article by James Bridle about how YouTube basically poisons babies' brains. So if any, everyone's got to read this article. It's about, it's about YouTube. It's like how, about how cartoons on YouTube, when you put them on autoplay and they're, you know, they're, they're designed to capture a, a baby or, you know, a toddler's attention. And they're all of those, th- all of these like, you know, videos, they're basically written by bots automatically by, you know, by these companies that they're just trying to get YouTube plays for advertising. And so they have bots like look at popular cartoons like Peppa the Pig or whatever and then um, and other cartoons that are popular with toddlers and then they just kind of like mash these things up and it's just a matter of time before they start using, you know, because they're using very basic techniques but maybe you can use like things like this to essentially uh, like essentially create a whole story and then just storyboard it automatically like you're going to like cartoons will be generated uh, almost are like as of today in 2018 cartoons for kids are, are almost entirely bot generated right 
like or, or at least the ones that that if you go five clicks deep maybe not their first pep of the pig episode but like five clicks later when you're into some random company like read this article it's like terrifying and the reason why it's terrifying is that okay it works right now for babies but now you know little by little it's going to start to work on adults like of course you know you can see how coherent it is so at that point you know well we can use our imaginations, right? Maybe later. Like, I'd love to see someone explore this in, a, like, a final project. Yeah, keep that. Keep that in the back of your head. It's terrifying, isn't it? Okay, so um, I'm, what I'm going to do now is, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to describe the tasks that we're going to actually, I'm going to take you through the notebooks, I think, after our break. Um, we'll, we'll do, like, um, I'll basically show you a few of these Python notebooks that do... Uh, do the exact tasks that I'm about to show you and also there's a few accompanying like open frameworks devices that that are useful for it as well I'm going to show you how to do reverse image search um, and uh, Oh, and then yeah, this is a bit of an aside uh, and actually Oren asked about this earlier So I said before like you can't use the raw feature vectors, right? Um, look how fast it is even while it's recording. It's like remember remember on my computer it would like like my computer, it was like just grinding to, to just shit. Uh, no, no, it was, it was like I, I had that and Open Frameworks and Ableton running and it was recording and it was like, and this computer is only like one year younger than, than mine. So I think some, my fan is broken or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, so we said we, ha we have to, where was it? I lost it. Where's that slide? Um, anyway, I, f I forgot that slide. Basically, we ha yeah, there it is. So we want to go from this to this, and we want, because because again, like distance calculations in high dimensional space are are kind of meaningless, and so in low dimensional space where the dimensions are linearly independent, they're much more meaningful. So how do we go from redundant, you know, highly uh, highly linearly dependent high dimensional feature vectors to mutually orthogonal low dimensional feature vectors? Well, the thing that was invented roughly 100 years ago to do that was principal component analysis, and that's one way of doing it. There's other ways, too. There's actually, but like, you could do it with a neural network, and that's even better. When we talk about autoencoders, we'll, we'll show what, what I mean by that. But a simple way of doing that is principal component analysis. One of the lectures later in the semester, when, when we get into generative models, is going to be, I'm go actually going to show you how principal component analysis works. Um, and so I'm not going to do that today. Um, it, because it's kind of more relevant to that material, but um, but just know that principal component analysis is a way of taking uh, like a, a high dimensional space and kind of warping it into a low dimensional space. It's like a it's like a transformation, like a, and it's, it's basically just a matrix multiplication that goes from the original data space, which you know again the columns are highly linearly dependent into a low dimensional feature space um, where they are linearly independent and, and preserve most of the variance in the original data. So the principal component analysis is this transformation that tries to preserve all of the variance by, by trying to find how the columns are kind of related to each other or how they correlate and then just kind of like uh, finding these, vec these like basis vectors within that space which, which actually like capture the most variance. Something like that. I, I know it's like hard to explain in one sentence. I'm going to do a lecture about this later, which, which hopefully will make a lot more sense then. But just know that principal component analysis is the technique that we will use in order to take these feature vectors and make them smaller. Um, so for the purposes of being able to do things like reverse image search. Then the, the other thing that I'll, the, then I'm going to show you two more things uh, after that in, in the Keras notebooks. One is uh, finding the shortest path between images. So let's say you have a training set, or sorry, you have a data set of images, and there are various things like scorpions and dinosaurs and soccer balls and panda bears and things like that. And so you can ask a question, given two images, can you find a path through your image space which kind of like finds you a nice transition? So like if you look at, you know, for example, this vase turning into a rollerblade, uh, sorry, turning into a motorcycle, and it kind of goes like, <laughs> I guess the biggest discontinuity is between the Buddha statue and the roller skate, <laughs> but I, I really like the rollerblade to motorcycle transition, right? 
you guys get the basic idea of what this is doing. So the, 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 the piano, to, piano to motorcycle, right? This one's really cool. So it goes from a piano to a chair to a chair with wheels to a like motorized wheelchair to a motorcycle, right? And so <laughs> I, I like that. It's like the addition of high level features to get it. And then, oh yeah, and of course the, the soccer ball becoming a panda bear. In creating that's great. Like this, <laughs> is, it, is it pulling images from the data set it was trained with, or is it more so like? Uh, it's it uh, well so um, I'll, I'll actually show you the notebook, but it, we're using a pre-trained neural network uh, to do feature extraction, mm -hmm. and then uh, actually this is this is how it works. This is how it works. Well, okay, this we're basically going to embed all of these uh, points in feature space, and then connect them with a graph. And this is a graph. A graph has nodes and vertices. And so the nodes are going to be the actual images. And the vertices that connect them are going to be basically ones that are close enough to each other. Uh, and then we just make a, then it's like a, um, you know, a, path, a shortest path optimization problem. Uh, we're, we're going to do the notebook, so I'll, I'll show you. Um, uh, now this was, this is actually like based on an installation by Mario Klingemann, who, whose work you're going to see a lot in the later half of this class. Mario did this thing for, um, for Google, like they had it uh, for something called Art Experiments, where they basically had a museum, uh, I don't remember what museum actually, does anyone know? Might be the British Museum possibly? No, no, that can't be right, it was in France, so maybe at the Louvre. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, it's a bunch of museums actually, Los Angeles County, and then Andes. Anyway, um, so they did this with, with images from a museum, and we can actually look at this. Um, it's pretty cool. So let's look at x degrees of separation. Right, so that's the one they always starts with, and then lets you do your own. So we can be like, okay, Let's pick, yeah, let's pick this and Obama. <laughs> That's kind of neat, right? Uh, anyone, someone pick one. I guess it's hard for you to pick, right? So I'll just pick, okay, this and that. Okay, well, you see it progressively has more and more people. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of decent. Some of them are, are harder than others, right? There, I've had a few pretty good ones like, okay, let's try. Ones that are really similar to each other from the beginning are, are kind of the best candidates. That's good, right? So it progressively takes pieces off <laughs> and then it wraps it. Not bad, not bad. So yeah, this is kind of, this is a pretty cool little work and we're gonna show how to do basically something just like this. And this is only with visuals, without any context, like cultural context, right? Um, well, I guess technically we, I don't know that because I, because, okay, actually that's, it, there is some, and I'll tell you why. The way we're gonna do it is just with the images because we're just gonna use straight images and features from images. But Google's uh, reverse image search is not just based on pixels because they have all of this rich metadata. And so the, the feature vectors have some of that inside also. And so, and I know he's using Google's feature vectors to analyze these, like Google's like reverse image search, like whatever neural network is responsible for that. And so I think there's probably some, something like that going on. That being said, I, I think maybe the way they did this experiment is just with the pixels because that's kind of the point of it. It's like trying to look for, I don't know though, maybe maybe it's using some of that cultural metadata. Um, you could do it either way. Like it's, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't. Yeah. And then it's like implementing in, like two neural networks together or is it just like a... No, uh, not necessarily. It could be. There could just be two feature extractors, but it could just be that its output is not only the like feature vector, like not only these, like it, it could be trying to classify the metadata, in which case like the features it learns are specific to that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
yeah so then the other thing I'll show you is TSNI so people who have been following this this class material like they and, and if you've seen any of my previous classes you know that I usually have a unit on TSNI which is which is really um, basically a data visualization technique TSNI is is in a sense it's like PCA in the sense that it's an algorithm for dimensionality reduction however uh, P, uh, PCA is kind of optimized towards like as good of a reconstruction linear reconstruction anyway it, it's as good of a reconstruction um, as possible that's its that's its goal um, while also being linear so that's kind of a constraint but that's that's the goal of PCA with TSNI the goal isn't global reconstruction so it's kind of a more lossy um, more lossy uh, um, dimensionality reduction however it is um, it's it, the good thing about TSNI is that it, um, it happens to be much better for visualization. And the reason why it's very good at visualization is that it tends to produce like nicely, nice layouts, which are not all clustered in one area. And it preserves local structure much better. So like if you, if you look at these things closely, like, okay, these images, it's a little hard to see, but these are actually images of numbers. You see them? There's like three, these are threes, eights, ones right so you see local integrity so like all the ones are clustered all the threes are clustered all the twos and so on and so um however you might not necessarily have a very good global structure so like images that are far apart don't aren't necessarily far apart you might get like two clusters of ones and on opposite ends of it something like that um so it's kind of good for for making like really nice aesthetically pleasing layouts the tsni is all is is like already maybe four or four years old and there's been actually like a few uh, more modern algorithms that I haven't gotten the chance to implement so we're not going to show them today but but for those who are who get really interested in, in in these data visualization techniques there's like a more modern algorithm like UMAP which is which deals with um, first of all can can work a lot better with a lot of points like very high dimensional TSNI tends to choke with anything more than like a few tens of thousands of points let's say um, whereas like other other algorithms are designed to scale much better there, there's also like variations of TSNI that do the same thing there's also variations of TSNI and UMAP and and I suppose a few others that um, are work in basically real time or, or, or work really fast TSNI actually takes a little bit of the, at least the original TSNI takes a little bit of time to compute um, and so those are all like various limitations but we'll show the the, the basic thing um, in the TSNI notebook um, now with with TSNI, you TSNI is a dimensionality reduction technique. So you could, in theory, take your four thousand ninety six bit vectors from, let's say, you're doing it with images, and then go straight from that to t uh, through TSNI to get it into two or three D. Uh, but in practice, we actually usually don't do that. What we usually do is we do PCA first, and then do TSNI on the result. So it's a two step process, and that's how the notebook is set up. The reason for this is because um, TSNI can be really slow um, in very high dimensional space and PCA is very fast because it's linear. Um, and so like, uh, so that's one reason and then also like, I think that's the main reason. I suppose maybe TSNI is not necessarily inherently good at taking care of redundancy, but well, maybe it is. I'm actually not sure. Um, but that's very typical to use something like PCA or maybe an autoencoder or something like that. We'll show autoencoders later in the semester, so don't worry about that. But um, but TSNI, uh, yeah, that's that's going to be like a pre-processing step. So this is what a TSNI of like an image set of animals looks like. We're going to produce this today. So here's the monkeys are all near each other, the owls and so on. Um, and then uh, we're also going to talk about a combining TSNI with like gridding algorithms. So for example, if you want to put uh, if you want to create a gridded layout, um, you can do that as well T uh, because you you can basically assign all of the unordered points in your 2D sort of uh, TSNI space into a grid assignment. Um, and, and Mario actually has some nice software for, for doing that. Uh, and yeah, so that's, so this is what a gridded TSNI looks like. Again, you can see like all of the whales are next to each other, starfish. There's a cluster of dogs here. There's a cluster of cacti and plants and there's like flowers somewhere, scorpions and so on. Um, so I, I made an open frameworks, I'll show you this in a second, but I made an open frameworks application that does this um, 
And so uh, it's it like it, well, like there's been a lot of nice examples of this. Um, so so yeah, I'll show you I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and then we'll also do an audio TSNI. So audio TSNI is the same thing except embedding points of uh, s sound uh, sounds into a two D space. Um, that usually a lot for the musicians in the room, this might be of interest to you. And um, for this, we actually like, or at least I'm not uh, in my implementation right now, which is out of date. Go figure. Um, I'm using actually like more or less traditional signal processing techniques for the feature extraction. So in, in digital audio, you can extract features from audio, like well-known features, let's say like uh, MFCCs, you know, like basically like uh, spectrum based statistics. Uh, for those who are familiar with that, you can use those as a feature vector. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. There's no neural network. A more modern approach is to actually do feature extraction with neural networks. You can actually like extract features from the neural networks. One way of doing that is just to interpret the spectrogram as an image and then extract feature vectors uh, and extract features from that. Um, there's actually like even better ways of doing it, which involve like, uh, like using straight up audio um, as, as like, like, like basically that's what wave nets are. Um, it uses straight like sample by sample audio as the input vector. And, um, and yeah, I'm going to show you both of these applications, one in open frameworks and one in processing that lets you play these back. So that's going to be also in the second half of today. Um, all of these are going to be ex like the things that I'm showing you, showing you, I'll, we'll, I'll come back and uh, like after the break, I'll show you basically like this. Um, we're going to go through a few of these notebooks and then uh, we'll also look at wiki TCD and so on. Yeah. Um, okay. Let, let's actually quickly take a break and, uh, you know, five, 10 minute break. And then after that, I'm going to go through the, um, the notebooks for TCD paths. And also we'll do a review of the <laughs> JavaScript ones. Um, and uh, yeah, after the break. What we'll do now is we'll kind of get into the practical uh, element of today's course, which is to look through a few of the guides, which is the ones that I just mentioned. And um, a lot of these tutorials are basically written down on, on this website. Let's actually go to it so that we can have a, have a look at it. Um, if you actually have it loaded, um, let's look at here. <clears throat> yeah, if you go to mlfreda.github.io <coughs> slash guides, you'll see that the all of the guides that we're going to look at right now link to are, are linked from here. There's a bunch that we that are referred to materials that we looked at previously. So, for example, like I just actually put these up, but um, the linear regression there's a linear regression notebook. So we talked about linear regression in week two, like how it works. And so, if you actually want to fiddle with it in Python, um, if you want to understand things from a data scientific perspective, then I would encourage you to look through these notebooks. And, um, and of course, some of the other ones. Later, uh, I'm, and I'm gonna mention, I'll, I'll talk about this at the end of today, but I'm going to release like certain supplementary materials I'm planning to do, which are kind of summaries of some of these other notebooks, including like the mathematics and Python and NumPy ones that, will, that should kind of get you up to speed with, with how to um, like do certain basic Python stuff that we're gonna need later in the semester, and also how to use the terminal. Uh, the one that we're going to start with today is actually this one right here called reverse image search. And this just links to an IPython notebook, a Jupyter notebook. Okay. So uh, how many people here have worked with these before or are familiar with what a Jupyter notebook are, notebooks are? Okay. A handful of you. For those who don't know, Jupyter notebooks are, they're basically this uh, container that can, uh, includes code and notes. So you, inside of it, you can write like notes you know, in, in plain markdown, like a wiki, and then interspersed with code boxes for Python code. And the cool thing about these is that you can actually execute the code. You can't execute it from GitHub because they don't give you that, that perspective. But if you look at it through a Jupyter viewer, uh, a notebook viewer, you can actually execute the code and it takes the code to either your backend or some other backend over a server. Uh, and that's actually what I'm going to show you in just a moment. Um, but this is a really nice way of interacting with, with code samples that people prepare for you. Um, there's a lot of like back and forth over whether or not Jupyter notebooks are actually good for learning. I, I think they are. They have certain limit, they have certain like weird things about them, how like things are out of order, for example. So that can be a little confusing, but, but if you get, if you kind of get 
over that at least, then, then I think they're actually quite useful because of the notes element. And so um, basically I'm going to take you through this notebook and show you how it works. I'm actually going to show you, show my, I'm going to implement, uh, not implement it, but execute it uh, inside of an environment. Now, uh, most of the Python code, uh, this is, I'll, I'll, again, this will be more relevant in a few weeks, but I'll just mention briefly, um, the, the kind of computer you executed on matters, of course, like some of this stuff um, don't, doesn't necessarily like uh, execute very nicely on laptops, uh, particularly MacBooks, uh, they don't have GPUs. And so um, it's go later we're going to actually try to get everyone set up on some cloud computation if you don't already have like an, if you don't already have like a GPU you can use. And so I'm actually going to use a service right now called um, Paperspace, which uh, for those who, who, well, probably most of you are not familiar with Paperspace is basically like a cloud service. Um, they let you uh, spin up a computer on in their server farm that has nice GPUs and has all the software installed, and so I can make an environment and distribute it for everyone um, to to kind of copy and use without having to install a lot of stuff. It does cost money, but it's a relatively small amount for educational purposes. Later, uh, I'll actually release a tutorial on how to get yourself started on either Paperspace or possibly Spell.run, which a few people. Um, like uh, Yinning and Chris have actually been using Spell, which is another service quite like Paperspace. Um, there's, there's a few of them out there. Uh, there's also like Amazon and, and Google, you know, they all have cloud, uh, they all provide cloud computation. Um, in any case, what I'm going to do right now is uh, not actually do that tutorial because I want to do that offline. Instead, I'm just going to take, uh, I'm going to go into my Paperspace and just begin to execute the notebook because the focus is on learning what the notebook does right now rather than um, getting set up with cloud computation because it's not necessary right now. Um, so so let me let me actually do that. So this is and this is how it will look. Like if you were to use Paperspace, once you get an account and you create a machine, you'll have a console view like this. And then basically you can you can actually launch a terminal. Like and this is a terminal that interfaces directly with my Paperspace computer. Right? It'll ask me for a login. In theory, or it'll just spin forever. Oh, that one. Okay. So yeah, you would put in your password. Now I'm inside. Now basically, this is a terminal window to this computer. Uh, not, no, sorry, not not the computer I'm using. Like this is not a terminal for the conference room computer. This is actually a terminal for this machine hosted by Paperspace. And we can tell that it's hosted by Paperspace because it, because it has GPUs, which we can find info on if we type NVIDIA SMI. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to launch a Jupyter Lab server. So what this is, is basically, because the terminal is a little bit of an awkward way to interface with this computer, so instead I want to interface with it something much nicer over a browser. So what I do is from the, uh, from the computer that's in the cloud, I'll type Jupyter with a Y lab dash dash no dash browser. And what this will do is it will launch a Jupyter server, which is accessible over this link. Now you notice that it says localhost 8888. Localhost means this, com like, 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 um, localhost generally means this computer, right? But in this context, this computer is actually that computer, right? We're looking at a window to another computer. And so if you go here, it'll actually not be visible. We have to create a tunnel between the, the server that's running on the paper space machine and my local computer so that, I can, so that I can interact with it here. And the way that I would do that is by going into a terminal on my computer and I will go um, SSH dash NL and this creates a tunnel between my port 8157 and then the port 8888 on the paper space machine and then we have to we go paper space at public IP address right right there copy that there now it asks for um, oh that's not right now it'll ask for your your password and then if it doesn't do anything if it just freezes that means it's working 
So now, what me, uh, you, and which is contrary to most other terminal commands that usually like if it hangs, it's doing something wrong. In any case, um, now I can open up a, a window here and go localhost 8157. And then it takes me to a login page, which asks for a password or token. This is for security purposes because we're interacting over the, um, you know, over like encrypted internet. But nevertheless, like there's a security mechanism to ensure that you're you're the person who's logging in. Um, and you can get that if we go back to the machine. You'll see that it gave us the token right there. So I can just grab that and copy it, and then bring it back here. And log in. And now we're inside of Jupyter Lab. So what is Jupyter Lab? Jupyter Lab is a very lovely environment for computation and note taking and, and organization and everything. It's actually a very new project. Jupyter Lab is like I think maybe six months old. It's it's kind of a um, a, a let's say a successor to Jupyter Notebooks or or let's say an extension of Jupyter Notebooks, which have been around for a few years. <laughs> And um, Jupyter Lab is basically this sort of all-in-one computation environment. It reminds me a little bit of MATLAB for anybody who, who ever fought with MATLAB as I did for many years. Um, and basically what you're looking at, I'll just take you on a short tour. I'm going to do this more comprehensively in, in the supplementary materials. Like I think maybe um, in two weeks I'll release uh, like a special video that goes through the mechanics of Jupyter Lab. So if this is if I'm going really quickly right now, um, don't worry, I'm going to do this in much more detail and release a video so that people know how to work with Jupyter Lab. But in any case, like Jupyter Lab gives you a file system right here, and um, and and also like uh, you, you the ability to create notebooks. So notebook, let's say I click Python three notebook. Now you see something like this, and I can actually write code here. Like okay, print hello world, and if I if I press the play button, it'll run that code and it goes, hello world. So what actually happened here? It, what it did was it ran a Python statement and it's not like the browser executed it. The browser doesn't have the ability to run Python code. What it actually did was it, it took this statement that I drew in my browser and it sent it to the paper space Jupyter Lab server, which, which has a running instance of Python and it executed it there and then took the output, the results of the output, which is just printing hello world, and it sent it back to me over the, over the network and displayed it in my browser. So I'm actually using the paper space machine to do the computation. So I'm not using the resources of my computer right here, the conference room computer, I'm using the paper space resources. And um, which, is, which is really nice, right? Because now whatever, uh, if the resources that the paper space computer has are very nice, like it has a good GPU, um, we can do things a lot faster there, right? E despite the network latency. Uh, yeah? So, um, theoretically, I, I can set this up on my home computer and have the same workflow? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, right, and so like other things I could do, okay, 5 plus 5 is 10, you know, 7 squared is 49. Um, and you can bring in libraries, you can import libraries. NumPy is NP. How many people have experience with Python? Okay, like maybe half of you, roughly. So, um, so you may be familiar with some of the things that I'm doing already. Import NumPy, right? Um, we'll be we'll be using a lot of this kind of stuff. So this computer, the paper space machine I'm using, already has all of the libraries that we need set up. So it's got TensorFlow on it, it's got Keras on it, and it's got NumPy and all these other scientific computing libraries. And uh, they're the ones that we're going to be using for these notebooks. And on your computer, you, you won't have these set up initially. You can install them um, relatively straightforwardly with, with Python, using pip usually. And, um, and also with papers, the cloud providers, they often have templates for like images of computers that already have a lot of the software that you need set up because everyone is usually working with a very similar environment. You know, everyone needs, everyone needs NumPy, everyone needs Scikit, so like you can, like Paperspace, for example, has a template called ML in a box, which has TensorFlow, Keras, Torch, and all of those set up already. So um, my template is actually based off of theirs, and that's the one that you'll, you'll be using as well if you, if you choose to use this. 
So let me go to, I have this folder in here called ML4A Guides. ML4A Guides is found here. Um, it's the GitHub uh, under ML4A, and this is all of the guides, right? And the, this ML4A Guides is actually a whole bunch of stuff in one, and I'll take you on a little tour of it. Um, the notebooks, which are here, are a bunch of IPython notebooks that demonstrate example, example things, including the image, uh, reverse image search and TSNE, which I'm going to do right now, and a whole bunch of other things. You can, um, uh, they're linked to from, from here as well. Uh, where is it? Uh, I'm afraid I get help that I know. They're linked to from here. So if you if you look at the Keras TensorFlow ones, these are all just linking to the GitHubs. And um, and when you click into one of these from GitHub, it'll just show you like the static thing. It won't be able to, you know, like if you click into image search, it'll show you the notebook, it'll render it, but you can't actually execute this code, right? So if you click it here though, notebooks, and put it into your Jupyter Lab viewer, it's going to, now we can actually execute, right? This is code. So that's what we're going to do now. Um, b before I do that, I just want to take you, tell you a few more things about ML4A guides. There's a bunch of other things that may be useful to people throughout this uh, semester, especially for practical stuff. These tools and utils. So tools over here is actually just a bunch of like um, sub modules. These are actually links to other GitHub pages which contain various implementations of uh, like uh, models, like interesting models. ML3 Guides Tools is actually like basically very similar to runway models. So when Chris and Alejandro show you the runway models, um, they're basically trying to do something very similar to me. We're actually trying to join forces a little bit. Basically creating uh, like a unified wrapper around a whole bunch of deep learning libraries that should become very useful to you guys, especially for final projects. So for example, like Pix to Pix is here and Neural Style for Style Transfer is here and so on. So that's what the tools are. And then utils for utilities. Right now there's just two things in here. There's these, um, there's a little Python script that can, uh, is capable of scraping WikiArt. So WikiArt is a, a website that has like several tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, freely available artworks like paintings that have been scanned in and so I wrote a scraper uh, So I should I shouldn't say I wrote it. I actually modified a scraper that was written by Robbie Barrett whose work I showed in the first week um, and uh, So you can get like tens of thousands of paintings. So that's pretty cool And then uh, this other script right here data set utils is something that's also a work in progress It's just a little utility for doing some pre-processing and post-processing of images we're going to use this later when we get into like picks to picks. This will be really useful. Um, don't worry about it for now. Like if, if you're interested in this stuff, then definitely look ahead of time, but we're not going to look at it in earnest until like two or three weeks from now. Another thing that is, uh, that is kind of uh, worth noting before I forget is, um, a former ITP -er and a former resident here, Aaron, um, Aaron Montoya, right? He wrote a really neat, uh, Google images scraper and Bing images scraper. And actually, it turns out the Bing Images scraper is a little nicer because Google Images, like um, they every every couple of months or so, Google Images will will like break whatever scraping utilities are out there for them. Um, like for example, you used to be able to click into each page individually, and now you have to scroll endlessly, and so it actually cuts you off at, after a certain amount of time. Uh, Bing doesn't do that though, so you can actually like like he was able to write a scraper that if you do a Bing image search, it'll download like like thousands of images. Um, so that's a really, really great way of creating a data set. Um, so, so yeah, that's something to lo look at. I don't have it linked here, but I'll, um, you can either ask me or ask him about it. He has it online. Um, and we will, again, like we will use it in a few weeks. So I think that's, uh, that's all the stuff in the GitHub that I wanted to mention before doing the guides. There's also like, we're going to look through the notebooks that's tools and yeah, that, that's pretty much, yeah. And then there's a Docker file for this for anyone who wants to mount on Docker. And if you don't know what Docker is, don't worry. We'll, you'll probably uh, get introduced to Docker next week by, by Chris and Alejandro. So, uh, okay, let's do the image search. So this guide, here I can actually make this invisible, 
This guide will take you through the process of taking a large folder of images and analyzing them so that you can do uh, feature, extra, uh, feature extraction and reverse image search on it. Right? And the way it's set up is that right now it does all of the analysis on, um, in Python. And so if you're doing a project in Python, that's all you need. But then uh, if you wanted to take the results and use it somewhere else, you can actually export them. Like you can export them as a JSON. That's what we're going to do for the TCD example as well. You can export this stuff and then import it back into any environment that you're more comfortable with. So if you're using Max MSP or Touch Designer or mm -hmm. Processing or whatever, you can actually like use these notebooks with those applications that you built in those other environments by doing the analysis first in one of these and then bringing in the results of it into your notebook or sorry into your whatever environment that you're using um, so that's just something to be aware of like like in case this feels a little bit too like too far left field like in terms of the things you're doing these things are meant to be very complementary to whatever tools you're you're using already so that's kind of the the idea so th there's some info about preparing a data set here. The data set I'm actually using uh, for the example is a data set called 101, uh, Caltech 101. And there's actually also Caltech 256, but I'm using 101. Caltech 101 is just this public data set that was collected for, um, for um, like, well, let's see if we can find it. Yeah, um, that's, that's, yeah, it's, it's just a bunch of images of 101 categories of things. Where's the listing? There should be, yeah, it should be here somewhere. Download. Well, anyway, I'll show it to you in a second because we haven't downloaded it. But you can download the whole data set here. And um, and so that's what I already have. I'll, I'll take you through it. It's inside of data folders. There's one-on-one -on -one object categories. There's a whole bunch of folders in it. So like, okay, brain. So I click into one of these and it's just a bunch of brains. It just uh, the images tend to be very random, so I think they're all scraped from online. Um, so, and and the the uh, yeah like okay electric guitar. That's not electric guitar, but okay. <laughs> Neither is that. What's going on? There we go. That's not an electric guitar either. What's going on? Okay, so it's not the most carefully uh, curated data set. There's finally electric guitar. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, you get the idea. There's 101 categories in here. We're going to use it, um, and we're going to use that here. So back to here. Let me make this visible. So the first thing, so this is how it works with, with the Jupyter Notebook. I can run this block of code, right? And it goes, okay, import all these libraries. It imported libraries from Keras, basically a bunch of stuff that we need in Keras. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm not actually going to take you through all of the actual code because that would take too long and it's out of scope. What I want to do instead is go from the top of this notebook to the bottom and basically tell you what each cell is doing and highlight some interesting features of, of the code that are worth under knowing about. If you decide that you want to either modify these or go into more detail, you should be able to kind of do so over a longer time frame. Um, because there is very good documentation and tutorials that I link to that um, you'll see that the code is actually quite readable. It's like, it's like learning processing, right? Each line, oh, I don't know what this means. I can find out if I just read the documentation and then slowly your knowledge of the environment is kind of strung together. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is instead just take you through the cells and execute each of the cells um, without necessarily just coding it from scratch. Because again, that would, that's a, for a much longer class. So Keras is imported here. And then in the next cell, this will actually download a neural network called VGG16. Um, Visual Geometry Group, I think that stands for. VGG16 was a neural network uh, with 16 layers, or is a neural network with 16 layers. That was the winner of the ImageNet challenge in 2000... 13, I think, um, and and so it's a it's a it's an already trained neural network, and Keras lets you download it. So if you now the first time you run this, it'll actually like it'll say downloading because it actually just has a link. It'll download it into the cache, 
I've already used it before, so it doesn't say that right now. But the first time you use it, it'll actually download the, the trained neural network from online. It's like 500 megabytes or something like that. Um, and it's just a whole bunch of weights. That's, that's all it is. Now we can actually, like Keras is really nice. It lets you, it has a whole bunch of like convenience functions. So for example, we can actually like run model.summary and it tells us all the layers in it. So now this, this may look like a bunch of jargon, but you should actually like, given the stuff that we have already learned about, you should actually be able to begin to recognize what these things mean, right? So input layer, right? The shape of the input layer, or what comes out of the input layer, is shape 224 by 224 by 3. That's the size of the image, the images, right? Why does it say none in the beginning? The reason why it says none is that when we actually forward um, images through a neural network, we forward usually batches of them. So we'll put like 64 images together in a big stack, and then forward them through the through the network, and um, so it doesn't know what the batch size is in advance, and so it just says none. But but really, it just means any number. It's a variable. the The point is these numbers are, are determine the shape of the activations of the images, and then then okay, block one conv one. This is a conv two D. This is a convolutional layer. So this is a convolutional layer. This is a convolutional layer, and um, it doesn't actually say. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say the, the shapes of the convolution, but you can see that there's 64 of them. You can actually figure out, you should be able to just figure out, like, if we do 17, 9, oh, I can't do math here, can I? Yeah, 64, 28, so it's, so with biases and stuff, so it's probably like 6, 5 by 5. Yeah, um, sorry, too much, too much to do. Um, so anyway, another convolution, then a pooling layer, right? We talked about these in week two. Convolution, pooling layer. Notice that the pooling layer has no parameters, right? Pooling layers don't have weights. They just, they just compact. Uh, Com2D, Com2D, so two, so two convolutions, a pooling layer, two convolutions, a pooling layer, three convolutions, a pooling layer, three convolutions, a pooling layer, um, another three convolutions in the pooling layer, and then this flattened thing, what that does is it takes all of the activation maps from, those, from, the, from the last pooling layer and it turns them into a big long vector. So that's your, that's one, that's your activations in that layer. And then FC1 stands for fully connected. So then what this network does, as is very typical, um, is to uh, have a fully connected layer at the end, which, which basically takes all of our activations and puts them into one big long string, then another second fully connected layer. And this right here is the golden one. This is the one that we're gonna use um, for our feature, uh, our feature representation of all of the images. By the way, notice that um, this network it says it has 138 million parameters. So, okay, let's let's think about that for a second. This is a neural network that has 138 million parameters. So that's a lot, right? That's why that's why the file that that has them that ha it's just a bunch of numbers, right? And the file that has them is like 500 megabytes or something like that. And 138 million parameters means uh, at like like not 138 million computations. It actually means significantly more. It means like probably probably billions of multiplications in one forward pass in the network. So that's so the the weights that were found are a are a single point in a 138 million dimensional space. And it's a so it's, it's golden. Yeah, that's that's kind of the idea. Also, notice by the way that that 102 million of the parameters are inside a single layer. So the first fully connected layer has has like uh, two thirds, three quarters actually, of the uh, total parameters in this layer that in, in this network. And that's actually very typical. Um, fully connected layers usually, um, because they're fully connected, they have a lot of connections. Um, they actually soak up a lot of the par parameters. Things like MobileNet, which you download in, in JavaScript, right? they're way smaller. Like MobileNet is just a few megabytes. So the way that they do that is by making a very much smaller network, in particular by eliminating this. So it's much smaller. It has like, it has like maybe one fully connected layer, which has like 100, something like that, 100 uh, neurons. So it has way fewer parameters. Um, at the cost of um, not being necessarily as ex like accurate or as, or as expressive, let's say, 
as a bigger neural network, but it's, uh, well, it's mobile. You can download it on a phone, right? You wouldn't make someone wait for a 500 megabyte download on your mobile app uh, that uses a neural network. And then at the end, the very last layer is the predictions, the classification. And that has a thousand neurons, right? Why does it have a thousand neurons? Because it has a thousand classes. Um, so, so that's our network. We downloaded it and it's called model, right? So let's actually like now, uh, yeah? What were the types of it so some of the parameters were not trainable? I'm just wondering what. Oh, uh, where does it say that? Oh, it's, okay. So um, there's zero of them right now. You'll see actually what we're going to do is we're going to set up a feature extractor and we're going to make a bunch of the parameters not trainable. And I'll, I'll explain why in, in a few cells. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so this function is defined here called load image. And what load image will do, and I'm just kind of more or less reading the notes. So you can go through this later in your own time and read this in more detail. Load image will load an image from the disk, from a path, and it will take the pixels and it will unwrap them into a, in, into a vector. And it's going to make it a one-dimensional vector, which has all of the pixels. It's, and it's also going to load the image at a particular size. And the size that it's going to load it in is the input shape of the model, right? Because the model is expecting images to be 224 by 224 by 3. So all of the images that go through it have to be resized to 224 by 224 by 3. And uh, this preprocessing does some stuff. I think it adds the average of image that to it or something like that. I might be wrong about that. But basically, it... Um, some keras preprocessing stuff. So load image is going to be used to load the image. So once we've defined this, we can run this right here. So okay, if I pick a different guitar, like I'll just write 222 or something, it's going to load this guitar and it'll show us the shape of X, one by 24 by 224 by three. So why one, right? Because it's a batch of one image. So that's why there's one here. And then the image size is 224 by 224 and it has three channels. And uh, so there it is, right? So what we can do is we can actually take X, X came from, X is the actual feature vector. Uh, sorry, not the feature vector, but the input vector, like the pixels. And then, it, um, and then model that predict will give us the predictions, which we can read here. So it'll go predicted Christmas stocking, <laughs> great. Christmas stocking with probability 219. Tennis ball with probability 155. Okay, fine, yeah. Electric guitar, Granny Smith Apple, acoustic guitar. This is a, this is a confusing guitar actually, like maybe, <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised how badly it did. Usually it's a little better. Let's try a different guitar. There's a guitar. Okay, electric guitar. Pan pipe, Har harmonica. Oh, I bet you it guessed harmonica because a lot of images of harmonicas also have guitars in them. I bet, right? Because like Bob Dylan, right? Anyway, um, so okay, so we can get decent probably we can get decent uh, predictions. Notice how high level Keras is. This is, doesn't look like this in, in TensorFlow. It's a lot uglier. Model that predict. So you you get it some you know some input vector and you go model that predict and it gives you your predictions and you can read the predictions using a function called decode predictions so that's pretty nice like you can see like two lines of code and you can create predictions from from this so uh, so start to think of these as like components that you can rip out of the notebook and begin to kind of put them together right like the way that you would in a max patch or something right in the max patch each of the objects or it's just another max patch right so it's kind of the how many people here use max msp Okay, good number of you. So you know what I mean. Um, now, okay, so how will reverse image search work? Well, recall from the slides that the idea is to, to use a trained neural network as a fixed feature extractor. So it extracts features from this layer of the network. Like we forward an image through it, and then we grab the activations in here. There's 4,096 of them. And that becomes our feature vector, which represents that image. And then what we do is we, um, we well, that, that's it. Like that just becomes our, our, our features for that image. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract the features for a bunch of images. And, um, and well, let's do that first and then we'll continue. Now, the next block of code shows you how to do that. So first what it does is it creates the feature extractor 
by what it, and what it does is it actually takes the model and it just it just makes a copy of it except it removes the last layer so you see this predictions layer we're going to make a copy of the network and just remove predictions we're just going to remove that layer so that works like this where it makes a reference to the input is model that input output is get layer fc2 right so it just makes a copy of the network but it stops at fc2 so if we run this we have this feature extractor and you see that it goes up until fc2 and then then there's no predictions after it the reason why it does this is now if this network if you run predict on it predict will just give you the last layer that's what predict means just give me the last layer and it will give it will it will give you this right so that's going to be the function of feet extractor so that's called feet extractor and so now we have this feed extractor. So now we can load this guitar and run it through here. And we, now we have this feed extractor. We can predict the features and we can actually plot them. So here they are. These are the features. Notice there's 4,096 of them, right? 4,096 uh, for associated with this guitar, right? If I run another guitar through it, you know, it'll be slightly different, but, but actually probably very highly correlated relatively highly correlated. So that's our, our way of extracting features. Now this block of code takes a reference to a folder which contains subsets, uh, which contains folders of other images. So here's our folder that contains one of the object categories. And then we go, okay, I want to keep 10,000 images at most. And it'll just take a random subset of, it'll load all of the file paths. This, this looks like really complicated code, but all it's doing is it's scanning the folder and grabbing all the file names, right? So we can actually like, so print images zero to five, like we can print the first five of them. So it's just an array that contains the folder for a whole bunch of images, right? Okay, so and we have 9144 of them. Now this block of code, what it will do is it will to it will begin it, it will actually um, iterate through all of the images so this will iterate through them load each image run it through feature extractor and then add its features to this big list of feature this matrix of features that will keep all of them so if i start to run this it will begin to analyze them and it's going to take a while so just for this reason, I've actually say I've actually done this did this process yesterday, and I saved the feature vectors. Have you ever watched one of those like uh, cooking info uh, cooking commercials where they like they like put something in the oven and then they walk over to the other oven and they're like and then 45 minutes later it looks like this. That's what I'm gonna do right now. It's actually extracting pretty quickly, so we can even wait for this one because it's already like 10% of the way through. Why don't we just do that? Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. Oh, using pickle, uh, that, that's here, that you'll see that, that's one of the blocks of code later. Pickle is uh, like a Python library that lets you just take arbitrary, like, arbitrary variables and just save them in binary. Um, so, um, so yeah, for, for this actually, we can actually even let it run because it, 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 feature extraction is quite quick. For the image paths notebook, which I'll show you in a minute, that, that, that analysis actually takes a couple hours. So, so that one I actually did save. Um, so, you know, these are things that you might have to like let your computer sit and do, do for a while. Um, in any case, like while it's analyzing, I can show you the code. So, if you that's actually down. Um, sorry, where is it? Staplers. Yeah, here, this block of code saves it. Um, so, what it does is it takes. We we haven't done the PCA yet, so this doesn't make sense. But basically, the images and the, fe the feature vectors, whatever you want to put, you want to save, you put it into an array, and then you go pickle.dump, and you dump the, these variables into this file. So it creates a file called features caltech101.p, and it writes all of that stuff in, in, as binary into it. And then later we can actually load it, and the way to load it, you'll see that in the, in the, next, in the next slide, but that would just be like this. This equals pickle.load, and it's going to be like this same load that file except RB uh, for reading either R or RB. I forget. I think, I think just, R, I think RB. Um, 
So yeah, that that's the way you want to do these. So this is actually a nice thing to know about about Python in general. You can always freeze, you know, whatever state you have. Um, yeah. So in any case, uh, let's go back up there. The analysis is down is done. So I finished extracting for for one ninety one forty four vectors. So here, check this out. I can make a new I can make a new cell if I want to play with play with things a little bit. I press the little plus sign here. I have a new cell. So print hello ITP, right? Right. So I can make modifications to this, which is kind of nice. It's like a really nice way of like, you know, you can think of it as like a little dashboard for yourself. So we can look at this really quickly. So like images, it, the or list images actually contains just the paths. This is just the paths to the image. Features, like we look at feature zero, that contains an array of features. This is this is four thousand ninety six bits. There's an ellipsis here, so this is actually an array of 4,096 numbers. If we look through the first five, you'll see that it's five of these, right? So features has all our numbers. It's a matrix, which has the number of rows it has is the number of images we have, which is 9,144. And the number of columns it has is the number of uh, features in the feature vector, the, the number of elements in the feature vector. That's 4,096, right? And we can actually like, we can do features that shape to, uh, oh, that's right. Um, you have to cast it as a matrix. So this will tell us the shape. 9144 by 4096, right? So that's what, we, what, that's what the result of the analysis is, okay? So now what we're gonna do is recall what I mentioned with the, with the uh, reverse image search. We want to take these vectors and we want to reduce them from 4096 dimensions to something smaller. And uh, we wanna reduce it in a way that preserves most of the information, um, but removes the redundancy. So we're gonna use PCA, and this block of code will actually do that. This basically imports principal component analysis from, from scikit-learn, and then it will create a PCA of 300 dimensions, and then it will fit, PCA that fit will Basically, um, we haven't talked about how PCA works, so this may not make exactly uh, sense right now. We're gonna, I'm gonna actually do a, a lecture that partially does that in a few weeks. But basically, like PCA that fit involves like uh, deriving a projection matrix that you multiply by the original features to get to your down your lower dimensional space. So PCA that fit actually learns that. So if I run this, it'll actually like it'll take like a minute maybe. Um, you can tell it's thinking because this little circle is gray. Now, when it's white, um, it's done. When it's, when it's blank, it's done. So, okay, we have this PCA. So there's PCA that fit. Now we've, we've learned the PCA. We can now take the feature vectors and transform them into reduced dimensional space. Right, so if I run this, it's really fast. It's just a multiplication, basically. And so now I can actually, like, if we look at this np.array features.shape, remember that was 9144 by 4096. And PCA features is 9144 by 300. So we converted the original features into a lower dimensional, 300 dimension feature vector, which has 300 elements in it. So now, finally, we can do this. We can pick a random image so this just picks a random image. There's faces in the data set. Let's not do a face. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of faces, actually. So um, airplane, perfect. So this loads the image. Remember, image lo load image. And then, and then we plot it. And then this right here, this block of code, it, Im it imports the distance module for, from SciPy. And then what it does is it this is a list comprehension. So if you don't know Python, this this block of code will confuse you. So don't worry. Um, again, I'm gonna do a like a Python tutorial in a little, in a little while, um, like an offline one. Distance dot cosine. What this does is it takes every single vector inside of inside of our PCA features, and it uh, computes the cosine similarity, um, or sorry, the cosine distance. So the cosine dissimilarity. Um, which is a like if you're not familiar with cosine um, cosine distance, you can look it up here. 
Co cosine similar cosine distance is actually just one minus cosine similarity. They're the same thing, right? So you just reverse the the cardinality. So it's it's actually just like it's actually just taking the cosine between two vectors. The point is that the and then um, like if two vectors are very similar, the cosine of the angle between them is zero, right? Or sorry, that is one um, because the cosine of zero is one, and so that means they're highly similar. And if they're completely parallel the angle between them is 90 degrees and the cosine of 90 degrees is zero and so they would be uh, they would have zero similarity and cosine distance is just one minus that so that's it it's a really i know it looks like really jargony but it's it's a super simple um super simple uh thing uh, where are we okay yeah so this computes the cosine similarity between the the pca features of a query and the feature and the PCA features of every other thing, right? So it does. Um, oh, I shouldn't call this similar index. I should call it. Oh well, yeah, fine, similar index. Let's call it that. So it computes that, and now this will sort all of those. It'll sort them by from lowest to highest. So um, we do this, and then we get this. We get the indices. Of the one of the elements that have the lowest to highest um, uh, uh, like distance, right? So then the first one should be the closest one. And actually, um, notice though that that I'm taking the first five results, but I'm actually starting at one, not at zero. So I'm going from one to six rather than zero to five. Does anyone know why I'm doing that? The reason why is because the first element in the list will be will be the distance between the query image and itself. So the the that's tri trivially it'll be zero, but we don't want we don't want it itself. We want the other images that are most similar to it. So I just skip. I'm just skipping the first element because it com compares it to itself. So we do that, and now this is a little convenience function which will load each of the images, the fir those first five, concatenate them into a single image, and then display it. So if I run this, bunch of planes. Let's do this again. So if I pick a random image, okay, that's a, on the brain. Nice. <laughs> Let's, no, we have too many brains. Let's do something else. Motorcycle. Mm, something more interesting. What the hell is that? Is that a cactus? <laughs> There's some really, really funky stuff in public image data sets. Um, some, what's that? Is that Joshua Tree? Oh, cool. All right, fine. Let's do this one. Why not? Yeah. Let's see. Oh, maybe it has the Joshua Tree category in 101 objects categories. Yeah? Hey, is there a way with um, your future lab to, like, when you reload one uh, cell to have all the subsequent cells automatically reload? Uh, you mean re recompute? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can highlight a bunch of them, and then I think, like, editor... I mean, you can always put the cells you want to, to in one cell, yeah. but I think you can take a, a subset of them. There's also like, you can run, yeah, it's like, okay, there's a bunch of, run all cells, so that'll run all of them. I don't know if you can run a subset, that might be, but you can merge cells. Yeah, there's, there's little things like that, yeah. So, okay, there's our similar things to Joshua Tree. It's a bunch of sco tiny scorpions, I think. <laughs> Um, the next cell actually just takes those functions and places them into fun into reusable functions. So get closest images. That's just wrapping the code that was here into uh, here and concatenate the images. So now if we run this, we can do this like repeatedly. Okay. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> Kangaroo and uh, and a lion. Let's do it again. Motorcycle, and really a lot of this, like arguably almost the same motorcycle. Okay, these are all I think the researchers who. I think that's how they made the data set flamingos. Yeah, so you get the idea. Uh, we can do it again. Yeah, there you go. Um, now uh, this block of code I just wrote this yesterday, so I haven't fully tested it, but basically. It lets you import new images. So like, let's say you did this analysis and then you want to import a new image which was not included in the original analysis. Then all you have to do is take the, you load the image 
and then you you we kept PCA. So then we take that we the original PCA we keep it, and then we can actually transform the new features that we just loaded into the PCA into the same projected space, and then we can do the calculation again. Right, so you can actually import new images and do the analysis. So this little kitty was not in 101 object, uh, 101 Caltech, but we can still analyze the images and get uh, like the same. We'll find out what was, yeah, we'll like the find out an index of similarities, and yeah, and this saves it. Okay, so now um, again, like uh, uh, we we. Like obviously we didn't we didn't uh, like I didn't show you too much about how like Keras works, uh, but however like please note that for uh, if you do want to like train your own neural networks for example there are notebooks that start from scratch so if you go to fundamentals actually they're in order over here <coughs> so if you go to yeah they basically start from scratch so like essentials of Python. Uh, this introduces NumPy, this does linear regression, and then this right here kind of starts with Keras. So if you go to the uh, neural networks example, this will introduce Keras and show you how to create a new, uh, like a, a Keras, like adding layers to Keras, right? This goes into like much more detail. And so uh, please do like, for those of you who wanna train your own networks, like if you can get through that, through the transfer learning example, Right, which will go through through the process of taking an existing training set, uh, sorry, an existing neural network, and then repurposing it for another classification task with fewer images. Um, this this notebook shows you how to do that. Then you will know like the the basics of Keras, and Keras has its own examples folder, so that's actually also worth looking into once you're kind of comfortable with this. Some of these are actually more or less our examples from Keras, and then. Yeah, the convolutional networks one. So that that's kind of gonna like we're already on reverse image search. So I'm showing you uh, like applications. Now again, like um, if this feels a little bit isolated from the stuff that you do, remember that you can actually go through this notebook without modifying any of the code, give it your own images, save all of the feature vectors, or save uh, save the index indices of like closest uh, like closest pairs. And you can save that as JSON or something like that. I actually didn't, for some reason, I don't have code for doing that right here in this notebook. I should add it if someone can remind me to do that later. But basically, like the other notebooks actually already do that, like the, uh, the TSNE ones uh, export to JSON. But if you export to JSON, then you can load the JSON in another environment, right? So this is all like, this is a tool to let you find similar images, right? So what could you do with this kind of stuff, right? Like you can imagine, like there's a lot of room for interaction here, right? Query a, um, you know, you get an image query and you give back something similar. So there's kind of like, it's a very generic, very generic task and you can imagine it being kind of interesting in a lot of different contexts. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions on this notebook? Okay, that, so that took uh, <laughs> a little bit more time than I imagined it would. So let me, let me just think for a second. Uh, we want to do the image path and the image TSNI. And I want to show you the, the applications for viewing them. And then, uh, what was it? What else did I? Let me just quickly look at my slides. Um, <coughs> want to do these T sneeze audio. Yeah, I guess we probably won't have a ton of time for ML5. But we did that another week, so. So, okay, so we should be fine. Like we'll do, we'll, now we'll do the, the pa image paths example and the um, uh, image CSNE. So let me do the paths first. So I'm gonna kill this running notebook so we can get, rid get out of that. Um, entitled. So this notebook uh, shows you how to do the, the X degrees of separation type thing. And what it actually does, is it assumes that you ran, okay, so we'll import all of this, and it assumes that we already ran, we ran the original notebook, and we saved the features here. I already did that. Uh, I think I did that. I hope I did that. So, okay, let's find out. Run that. Yes, I did. So we have this file, features caltech101.p, 
which is which um, is inside here. So that was the result of running the image search notebook. That's right there. So that contains the, the PCA features that we saved with Pickle and the PCA itself. And so now we can actually, um, we can load, load it from disk. And so we recovered the stuff that we had in the original notebook. And, uh, and we do this because we're actually going to use those features as the basis for the image, uh, image path thing. So this will keep some of the images. And then it will, um, and now, now this function right here is using a library called iGraph, which is a Python library for making graphs, right? It's available in R and in, and in Python. And you know, you can, I think there's probably good visuals. Let's you make graphs, right? And the, remember, the whole idea of the image path I, example is that we have all of these images embedded into our PCA feature space. And so we're going to connect images with, with uh, connections only if they're sufficiently close to each other. So, so that means that it's a sparse graph. Like the distant examples are not connected to each other. Only ones that are close to each other are connected. Let's see if we can get an example that looks... So that, uh, that's kind of, yeah, like this seems to be only connecting local nodes, right? So that's the idea of doing of this as well. What it does is it says, okay, we're going to connect every node, every single image to its 30 closest neighbors. So we create a graph. And then we say we're going to have this many vertices. The, the vertices are the nodes. And then it does, it does this. It computes the distances, right? It is the same distance measure we used before. Then it keeps the 30 closest. And then it adds an edge between the, the active node and each of its 30 edges. Now, if I begin to run this, it's going to take a really long time. Uh, it, it looks like it's going kind of fast, but it slows down because as the graph becomes bigger, the uh, the actual like uh, adding edges becomes slower. So when I did this yesterday, it took like it took like two and a half hours or something. So and, and actually also TQDM is broken. It's supposed to be one line. It just keeps on adding it to the screen. Actually, maybe I think if you do it the second time, it, it might stop. No, it's even worse now. It's like two lines. For some reason, that's a bug in TQDM that has to be fixed, or maybe in Jupyter. Anyway, like we don't need to do this because I already did it, and and here it is. Like this, once it's once you're done, see what this does. It saves, it saves the graph, and dumps it into Graph Caltech 101 30 K and N. So if I want it, I can actually just this is the like here's the pre-baked oven, right? I'm just gonna load it into memory, and we can pretend that we did this whole process, right? So now I have the graph. So now we can make this get concatenated images and we can do a query. So here, this will pick two random images and get the shortest graph between them. And then it will retrieve each of the images and concatenate them into a single image vector. Okay, so let's, let's do a few of them. Okay, so this is one endpoint, is this airplane. And this is one endpoint, which is a, a ship, I think. So it just goes like airplane, 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 helicopter, ship. Okay, it's not, not super interesting. Ship to chair. Right? The, the, this won't be quite as appealing as, the, as Mario's, and I'll tell you why in a second. Let, let's just do, a, let's do at least one. Then. Okay, yeah, not so good. Okay, this actually demonstrates just why this data set is really bad for, for, for this, this task. The problem is that 101, uh, Caltech 101 is a data set of things that belong explicitly to 100 categories. And so the images are already extremely strongly clustered. There's not like a very good continuity between images. So this tends to be like more interesting for, for, in, for data sets that are not so strongly clustered. That's why it goes like face, 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 tree. Yeah. So like sometimes I get pretty decent ones. We can 
Come on. That's a little better. A little better. Oh, that's pretty good. Elephant through dinosaur to flamingo. Face to face. That's kind of neat. Decent. Saxophone the gun. Oh, that one, I like this one. Finally, this one is excellent. Starfish the dragonfly to building. Is this doing a rotation itself? No, 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 that, that's actually the way the images come in the data set. This data set is originally for image classification, so they, you know, it's like, this is really old school data sets from the 90s, I think. And so it's, or maybe the early 2000s, and so like they just have artificial like warping things to, to kind of like try to make it a little more difficult. So there's no cell phone image. There's no what? Cell phone. Oh, um, I don't think so. There might be there might be a cell phone category. There's probably no smartphones. Um, but cell phones have been around for uh, since the '90s, right? So, yeah. Okay, so that's the image paths thing. Um, yeah, let's do another one. Another one. These are some of my favorite examples. This, again, this works better for a different data set. So like, try to find a data set of, of images that you, that you think is interesting and apply this technique to it. So like a data set that has a, a wider spread and has like, this is like densely populated category. Exactly, it's really strongly clustered. So yeah, that's, that's not ideal. So essentially all it's doing is it's finding the two, the two points on, um, within the, um, Space and then it, it draws a vector between the two, and then all the images that are just sitting along that vector incidentally. Not exactly, no, um, because you're not going to have points sitting along that vector. What it actually does is again, this will look better in the slides. Like, um, uh, it com constructs a graph. So our points, our images, are these are these nodes. And then it com c connects every single image to its 30 closest neighbors. And then let's say given a query, like, okay, given your query is connect, connect two to six. So it would find the shortest possible, like fully length vector, uh, fully length path um, through from two to six, right? And there's multiple paths from two to six. So you go two, three, four, six. You go two five four six. You go two one five four six. You go two one five two three four six. You know you you get the idea, right? You can see intuitively what the shortest path is, but remember these things are typically, you know, in, in our example we have ten thousand images, and there and there's uh, at least like thirty uh, thousand connections. I'm sorry, three hundred thousand connections, um, reciprocal, and so like to actually compute that in real time is no is, is is actually difficult like it has to use a very highly optimized algorithm to to get you an approximately good result um, and it uses some clever like optimization techniques under the hood that's what iGraph is for so yeah that's how it does it so it doesn't actually connect connect a line so to speak um, you could try doing it that way but that that won't that won't necessarily work very well um, okay, so now we're going to do TSNI, and TSNI involves taking the feature vectors and reducing them down to PCA with PCA first, and then applying TSNI to get them down to two or three dimensions. Um, so like, for example, these animals. I'm going to show you a few cool TSNIs, oh, and then yeah, and the gridding approach. Let me show you a few of them. So this is a gridded TSNI of animals. I'm going to show you actually uh, an open frameworks uh, uh, application for doing this as well. In fact, maybe I should show you that instead of the guide. I think I, I might do that to save time. So um, you can, there's a tool in the ML for AOFX collection that will let you make these. And, uh, and I actually released it online. A bunch of people like ended up using it for cool projects. So for example, like one of Golan Levin's students made a TSNI of IKEA. Let me actually show you that. I have the... Uh, it's here. 
That is, oh, it's in my downloads actually. <coughs> These are all these are all scraped images from IKEA. The question is, why isn't IKEA's catalog like this? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, isn't it right? It's a perfect data set. Uh, if you want it, you should you can ask them. I think they have a like a scraper. So thousands of images. Here's our lamps. There's a random chair in the uh, next to a lamp. Sometimes it messes up. Oh, that's cool. Little babies. <laughs> so, um, and then, yeah? In this case, is it just trained on what the product type is or something? Or? It, it's actually just using, like, again, like, we are using a pre-trained neural network to do the feature extraction. Right. So it's not actually trained for that um, specifically. You don't need to. Um, this is by um, Moritz Stef uh, uh, Stefaner. Stefaner? These are impressionist paintings. That's a little blurry. I think it'll. So that's kind of cool. Can you sort, sort them by different, uh, in different ways? Like change, change the way that they're being sorted? What do you mean? Like why, 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 let's say, the bright ones are on the left? There's no, there, in TSNI, it's like stochastic. It doesn't actually, the axes have no meaning. It's just trying to find the layout which preserves mostly local relationships. Yeah. Is anyone doing this in one than two dimensions? Uh, yeah, you could do it in three. So like, so like typically you would do it for two or three. That's the whole point of TSNI because it's nice for visualization. If you were to do like four, it doesn't quite make sense because, because then you can't visualize it and uh, there's other, and, and so usually if, you, if you're doing it for a different number of dimensions, you probably have a different reason for doing it other than visualization, and so then you would use something else. Um, but yeah, you could do this in two or three D. Or one D? I think also one D feels to me like there's other, there's, so one D is like a special, is just another way of saying like, um, is like traveling salesman, right? So traveling salesman problem is a path that goes to every single image, you know, in order. Uh, that's basically a traveling salesman problem. And so, like, it doesn't, I don't think TSNI is really optimized for that. I mean, I, I guess you could do TSNI in one dimension, but I've never seen anyone do, do that. Um, it's, it's a different problem to solve, slightly different. Yeah. And then also Zach Lieberman, who made Open Frameworks, he made this thing with satellite image, imagery. So that's cool, right? And these are usually full length, uh, full size samples, right? So the reason this this image came to me because it's just you know everything is down sampled, but you can totally like, um, you know, like you you can imagine making like much more interesting ways of browsing these with the full resolution samples. Yeah. So to, to run them through, um, to run them through the network, you have to down sample the two where. Yeah, but but that that's just for the that's just for finding the embedding. And then you just keep the length to the you, you, um, you could, yeah, yeah, like you could keep, you know, for display purposes, you can use the original high resolution ones. The down sampling is just for the purposes of the analysis. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me actually do this. So let, let, here's what I'm gonna do. Just in the interest of time, I actually wanna show you the open framework stuff. I'll tell you this, that the, Im, if you go to the notebook, image CSNY, this will take you through the process of do, uh, of like, it, it, it works very similarly to the image path thing. You load the images from, from, the, from hard disk, you keep some subset of them, and then this, this is all it is like, t uh, oh actually, uh, yeah, because we did the PCA features in the image search, so we have the PCA features. And then this is all TSNI is, it's just one line of code basically. You, we create, we take our PCA features, we make them into an array, or like a matrix, and then we run them through TSNI, and this TSNI is implemented by scikit-learn, and then it runs TSNI, it takes a few minutes, depending on how, ma how many images you have, and it gives you some layout, then I take the layout, and I, uh, because the layout is sort of, the axes are kind of meaningless, 
so I normalize them for zero to one for convenience. So this, so then all of the x y points get normalized to between zero and one, and then this will simply iterate through all of the images, load the each image, take their corresponding T SNE uh, assignment, and paste the image, paste the tile onto a new image called full image, and then that looks like this. And then I just save it to disk, so you can save it. And then uh, this will actually, this is important because this is what we're going to use in the open frameworks thing. This lets you export the results. So this little thing here is going to create a JSON file and it's going to, and it's going to put all the data into the JSON. It just dumps it all to JSON and inside of the JSON, we can actually look at it. Um, it looks like this. Uh, let me quickly go to my documents. So once you export, you can download it and then you can go to your image TSNI and then, um, oh, where do, where do I actually put it? Did I? Oh, I didn't. Oh, you could. You, okay. So I don't actually have an example here. Sorry. Um, it's just a JSON file that has the paths and the images and then you can read it and grab each of the paths and the TSNI embeddings. So here, let me show you this other application. So if you don't like all the Python stuff, there's an application here called Image TSNI Live. And this is an open frameworks application that will let you do the whole thing from scratch. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to click analyze. Actually, so here's how it works. So there's a few things you want to set. How many, how many images you want? Maximum. Let's do, let's go up to, you know, like 1500. It'll take a random subset of images out of 1500 that I give it. Um, actually, let's, let's go up to like more. <laughs> I have 2000 images in, in this folder, so it'll just take the maximum. So there's 2000 images. Don't worry about perplexity and theta. You can leave them at the default. They're just parameters that control a little bit about the TSNI. Um, then I'm going to click analyze new directory. And then it lets you like navigate to a folder of images. And I have one prepared here called animals. So I'm just going to click open. And now it loads all the images. There's one 1999 of them. So it's loading them right now. And while it's doing that, I'm going to show you the, this folder. Here it is. Here's animals and a bunch of cute bats. Right, it's got bats, bonsai trees, cactus, camel. Right, so you get the idea. It's just a whole bunch of folder. It's just a folder of 2000 images of, of different animals. And these are actually taken from Caltech 101. Actually, they're taken from Caltech 256. That's a different data set, which is related, like the follow up to Caltech 101. And I just took all of the image cat. I just took all the categories of animals. So here's all of the animals. And now what it's doing is it loaded them all into memory. And now it's doing, this is the slowest part. It's actually now extracting, it's running them all through a trained convolutional network and extracting their feature vectors. And so it's doing that for all of them. And when it's done, it's going to then do the layout. It's going to then calculate the TSNI. And then you will we'll be able to browse it inside of inside of this application. So this will take a few minutes. Like so, let me let it go, and then I'll keep going through some of the other stuff, and we'll come back to the image TSNI um, image TSNI example. But just this is just for for this is uh, an application that does everything end to end. It does the analysis, and the um, it does the analysis, and it actually is a display window as well. Okay. So while this is doing, I'm going to show you now the audio TSNI because we have about maybe 10, 15 minutes left. So I'm going to show you the audio TSNI now, um, which, which uh, you do have to use the notebook to do the analysis for. Um, and, uh, and that'll basically probably be all we have time for today. I'll maybe uh, put up a, a couple extra slides about, about, the, um, about the ML5 stuff. But, um, but yeah, let's, let's let this go and we'll come back to it. So then the audio TSNI is over here. Let me show you the audio TSNI, what I mean by that. So here I've already done one and I have two, uh, I have two viewers for them. One is in processing and one is in open frameworks. The open frameworks you can just download as the release. Like this is in the ML free OFX releases. I already mentioned this a few weeks ago, right? But like the, the, all of these applications that I'm using, this is in the ML free OFX repository. Here's all the code. This is all open frameworks code. And then if you click on releases, 
you can actually download all of the applications. They are standalone applications that will just work on your Mac. So I think everyone already did this, right? I think everyone already has this. Um, so yeah, if you don't, this is where you can get it. In any case, like um, if, if I go to Audio Tsni Viewer, Audio Tsni Viewer is actually looking for a file called Audio Tsni.json. We can open this in Sublime and we can look at it really quickly. And let's wrap. Hi. How do you do word wrap? There we go. So it's just a big long file that contains a list of of um, paths to audio clips and the TSNI embedding. So the TSNI embedding is all is x y points between zero and one. So here's the path to the clip, each clip, and then here is. Um, yeah, and then here is the TSNI embedding. So Audio TSNI is automatically looking for that file. And then if we click Audio TSNI Viewer, it's going to load it. It's going to load all of the clips into memory. Before I blast the... Yeah. These are all drum samples. One. Now, if I change to this one to actually be like, I'm going to change the name to this um, to Audio TCD three, and I'm going to make this the one it loads, which is Audio TCD two. This one contains clips from Bohemian Rhapsody. So, if I open Audio TCD viewer. That's the me cluster. So that's cool, huh? <laughs> um, the so yeah, Audio TCD is just looking for a file like this. Audio .json, and you can actually generate it using um, using the, there's two ways of generating it. One is using one of these notebooks. So that's the Audio TSNI notebook, and this will take you through the process of doing that. Um, so first of all, let's just see how this is doing. Okay, we're about halfway. Um, the, now there's two ways of doing this. One is to go through the notebook, um, and uh, to go through the notebook and then give it a path to some uh, some so, to a folder. So there's there's two ways of doing this, right? One is you give it a folder of small clips. This only works really for small. The way that it works, the way that the audio TCD viewer is set up, it only really works for small clips that are relatively homogenous that have like one timbre for one second. And analyze that for a second. If you want to analyze songs at the song level for similarity, that's a lot more complicated, right? Because songs sound different throughout their time. It's like how do you define two songs that sound similar? That's a, actually a major topic of research in the music information retrieval space. This is much more just like incidental, like small range, temporal, timbre similarity, right? Um, so you can either do it on the clip of small audio clips like drum samples, or you can take one song and split it into chunks. And this, this folder will do both of them, I think. So this will load all of the clips. And then this is using a library called LibRosa. So this is all described in a notebook for installing LibRosa. You can install LibRosa. You can do this on your own computer, by the way. Like this is, does not necessarily require GPU. And it, it uses LibRosa to do a bunch of audio spectral analysis. So for those of you, this is beyond the uh, scope of this class. So I'm not going to describe what these things are in technical detail, but you can learn about them in, in you know, more or less like digital signal processing no notes. So this is a feature vector that contains the 
MFCCs, these are Mel frequency cut stroke <laughs> coefficients. Anyone know what those are? So, yeah, oh, okay, oh, nice, okay. They're, they're, yeah, like we, we won't get into the details of them, but basically the mel frequency co capture coefficients and their derivatives and their second order derivatives. So like the velocity and the acceleration of how they're changing over a short time frame, like in, within one second. And that turns out to be like a decent characterization of the, of the texture of the audio, let's say. So this returns a feature vector. So then we go through each of the clips and see that it grabs each of the clips and then it runs them through the analyzer and adds them to a uh, feature vector, uh, feature matrix array. Then it calculates the TSNI of those uh, feature vectors. There's no PCA, there's no need for PCA here because the feature vectors are already only like 30, I think 36. I think they're 36 elements, so they're pretty small already. So then we do a TSNI, normalize the TSNI, it looks like this, and then we save it. And then this will, again, same thing, saving JSON. Um, it'll save it to this example audio tcni.json and then you rename it audio tcni.json and put it into the data folder of the ml for AOFX repository and then ml for AOFX will load it. Uh, it will load it. It'll load all the clips. Um, make sure you don't change the, where the, the clips are. Um, oh, that, that's actually a minor thing. So like if you do the analysis in paper space and then you download it onto your own computer, the location of the paths has changed, right? You're, you're downloading it, you're looking at it on your own computer. That's easy though. All you have to do is just open the, t the JSON file and do like a find replace on the root of, on the root folder. So like if it's inside of home paper space, you know, whatever. And then on your computer, it's home, your name slash documents slash whatever. You can just do a find and replace minor, minor inconvenience, but, but that's, you can do that. Um, the other thing is that you don't necessarily have to do it on paper space. You can, if you look at the guides and you go to the audio TSNI, clustering sounds with TSNI, there's actually, um, oh, that, well, that's, that's this actually. There's actually in the ML Frey OFX repository, um, ML Frey OFX, if you go into that repository, you'll see that, um, you'll see that there's inside scripts here, you have this TSNI audio, and this, you can actually run that script there's a guide for doing this. Um, you can you can actually just run that script directly on your own computer. I think that is here. Yeah, Audio TC Viewer. This tells you exactly how to do that. So install Librosa, and then and then on your own computer you can run that TC Audio. You give it a path to your whatever directory of files you have, or or to your input file like Bohemian Rhapsody. Then you give it a path to put all the clips into and where to put the JSON, and then you could just use that directly. So that's, that's the audio. So you could do it either way and just refer to the guide uh, for the specifics of that. Uh, okay, we're done the image CC live. Let's look at this. So it computed the image CC. So first of all, you can scroll a little bit with it. This is a really neat little application. You can actually, this is the unordered, like it's ungridded, right? So we can make these a little smaller or no, we can scale them out, right? We can spread them out. And we can kind of like browse it this way. Or we can try to look at all of them at the same time. Um, image size. All right, that's all of them. Or uh, we can then click view as grid. And then we have this grid. <coughs> so this is why it's nice to do this in open frameworks. You can create applications that let you view it and kind of modify it and mess with it a little bit. Um, I encourage, for those of you who are, how many people here are using open frameworks? Just a couple of you, okay. For those of you who are using open frameworks, like the best thing you can do is just like to compile this code directly, because then you can start to make changes to it. You can expand it. Like I had one student who made, took the audio TSNI thing, made it 3D, and then made, uh, made his own like uh, trajectories, you know, like a, like a little cursor would kind of run trajectories through the clips and keep on and play them automatically. There's like a lot of stuff you can do once you're inside the open frameworks um, environment. Wait, with the 3D thing, is that like a different algorithm or just like keep the textures Oh no, it's the same. It, it just it just keeps three columns. Uh, like it, it's the same algorithm, but but here I have it set to do two. You could you could totally do 3D. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if, if for 3D, all you have to do is in the uh, well here you can you can it's one of the flags in this path and then also in the notebook you see where it does TSNI? It's just right here, end components. Oh, okay. 
So change that to three and then you'll get three. Um, so yeah. Then the other thing with this, you can also now, um, you can either, you can save a screenshot. So it'll say like, and if you make it really big, when you, it'll save it at this resolution. So if you do this, it'll save a screenshot. I already did this because it takes a little while to, to write it. So that's what, so then you can get this, this right here, right? This is actually, it's 126 megabyte PNG. So it's really large. It's 10,000 pixels by 7,000 pixels. So you can export this thing as a gigantic PNG if you want. There it is, right? It takes preview actually a long time to, it's actually a little nicer to just do it in open frameworks. Um, Okay, you can see it. this is starting to, it'll take a little while to depixelate it, but you get the idea, it's in there. <laughs> um, and uh, then, unfortunately, the, uh, wait, how is this, is this, I think I don't have this implemented yet, or do I? Oh, no, it's not, okay. <laughs> yeah, so just like, I have to fix that. Basically, or not fix it, but yeah, it, w it used to work, but then Open Frameworks changed the way it does JSON. Um, so, okay, so that's image CSNE. Um, okay, we have like one minute. So basically, like, I just want to kind of wrap up. Uh, we did the T we did the, we did the search and retrieval paths, right? Um, give me a couple minutes here. So we did uh, TSNEs and paths, right? So that's been kind of our focus today. And what's going on here? Oh. Yeah, we did audio feature vectors. We learned the audio TSNE. I wanted to show you this really quickly. We don't have enough time to look at it. It's also, it doesn't fully work as, as well as it ought to, but if you go to my website and then you click on archive, I think it's an, uh, yeah, this thing right here, wiki tsne. Yeah, so this is like, I have code for how I did this. So this is basically analyzing Wikipedia articles. If we do, we might end up doing one lecture about like text stuff. So where I might go into more detail, but basically this is using a technique called latent semantic analysis to, to get a feature vector for each of the Wikipedia articles. And then I have an IPython notebook. I'm gonna to try to merge this to ML4A. I have to clean that up a little bit because it's, it's probably not, it's not actually a good way of doing this. Like I need to, uh, I need to improve this a little bit because it's just doing like, it's, well, okay, for technical reasons, like I need to, I need to fix this. But the point is that if you're interested in doing this for text, uh, let me know because like maybe in a week or two, I might have a better version of this. And, and um, it's something, it, at the very least, you can certainly refer to this article, to this notebook to get a sense of how you might do this for text. Cause you know, you can do feature extraction for text as well. So that's something just to yeah be aware of. And then I was gonna do some review. Obviously we don't have enough time for this, but basically let's just kind of wrap up and start talking about the mini presentations, right? So let's just review everything we've learned, right? We've done a few notebooks and uh, like, which, which you probably are not gonna be needing to do really so much. This is more of an introduction to the second module. So you don't need to worry about that for the mini projects. For the mini projects, I think the things that you'll wanna use mostly are ML5, open, uh, open frameworks examples that I showed you, and processing, right? And so basically the idea is to take some of these applications, especially the ones that work in real time, and to do some sort of like a hack on top of them, right? So on ML5, the main resources we showed were the ML5 JS, um, uh, uh, ML5 JS examples. You can get those by the way, we didn't show this in any of the classes, but if you go to ML5 JS's GitHub, you'll see that there's a examples here, ML5 examples. If you clone these, you can run them right away. It's like really, really easy. Is they've done such an incredible job? Like really, like if you go, okay. So like I'm gonna go to the my documents folder. I have it here, ML5 mm -hmm. examples, right? And I go Python dash m simple HTTP server, right? Now it's serving this on localhost 8000. 8, 8, I didn't do any modifications. I just cloned it from here, and then you see in p5.js you have, for example, the YOLO script. Like, okay, it asks to use my camera. And now it's loading the model. It takes, like a, it takes maybe 10 seconds or something. And then it begins to do object, real-time object detection, right? So person, right? So you have this inside of JavaScript. Cell phone, right? Or <laughs> remote cell phone, right? So you get the idea. It's like really, really, like really well done. And, and the actual code for this is very compact. If you look at the actual code, um, 
you and we can actually do that like uh, YOLO index.html. Oh, that's well, yeah, we can, sorry, sketch.js. It looks, it looks like any other, um, it, it should look more or less like any other P5 sketch you've seen. It's really short. It does all of the ML5 stuff inside of here. And it just calls this function detect. And whenever YOLO grabs ob, uh, some, some captions, it puts them into objects, right? So you have that, you have um, the ones that are gonna be relevant to us. Don't worry about pics to pics and style transfer yet because we haven't really done the generative stuff. You can, if you wanna look at it, we looked at the feature extractor, right? That was in the that was in the demos where you do some sort of like a train your own image classifier. So okay, yeah, basically a lot of stuff is available for you as well as the ML for A demos, which are basically like the ML five demos, except there's a, just a couple of extra ones like the Pong demo and so on, um, and the PoseNet music one. So that's available for you, and um, also, and and also we haven't done any Wackinator stuff, but. I very much encourage you to look, and maybe we'll do it in, in maybe, maybe when I'm here, I might do something briefly. On it. But the thing is like, it hasn't changed that much and there's learning resources online that are really good for this. Wekinator is quite good for situations where you don't have, uh, where, where maybe ML5 is a little bit too constrained, like uh, custom inputs, something like that. And you can take uh, Rebecca Fiebrink's course on Cadenze, uh, Rebecca Fiebrink is a, a creator of Wekinator. And it's, uh, she has an online course about it. There's also YouTube lectures that are really short. There's just like three minutes, how to use Wekinator. It's really, really nice and easy and it can do, I haven't shown it because it's very much cross-functional with ML5. And so ML5 has kind of eaten away some of the use cases that I would have normally used for Wekinator because it's online. Uh, but Wekinator is still more, a little bit more functional than ML5 in terms of like getting custom inputs and things like that. I think ML5 is going to improve over the course of the semester, so that might might be a little better. And then the ML for AOFX, I got you showed I showed you guys that you can build games, you can control your keyboard, all that kind of stuff, stuff that I showed in the last lecture. And then I haven't shown this yet either, but any, for anyone who's interested in Raspberry Pi stuff, check out the ML for for Pi library. I, I haven't really tested this very well, so anyone who's doing Raspberry Pi stuff and wants to work on this with me, actually, I'd be I'd be super down because I want to develop this library a little bit more. Um, so, and you could do stuff like, like the thing that Bjorn did, like making devices light up, um, when they're not working. Okay. So the way the mini presentations work, three to five minutes per person, uh, uh and again, tell me if you don't want to present, you can just, you can come to me during office hours instead and show me what you have. And these are all the tools that, that you have at your disposal. And then when we get back, uh, after doing the mini presentations, we're going to start the generative module. We're going to start making things like this. We're going to like start making cool generative arts, look at GANs. Uh, auto encoders and all that good stuff. That's going to be kind of the focus of the next uh, segment of the course. Okay, sorry I ran a little bit long. Um, I'll see you guys in in three weeks, but I'll be I'll be here the middle of next week. So like I'll still be here, but we're not going to have class over the next two weeks. So take a little break from me and uh, and come here, but come here next week and talk to Chris and Alejandro uh, because they're going to show you runway, which is absolutely awesome. Same time, yeah, probably not as long. So, um, uh, what is Memo Oh, he's going to be here this Friday. Uh, so Memo's here 4.30 p.m. on Friday. He'll be here. We're going to do it in the lounge. So normally we have it at 5, but it's going to be at 4.30, so it doesn't conflict with the pizza. <laughs> so we're going to do that, and then, and then the pizza will be right after the talk. So please do come to that. It's going to be really fun. Memo's an awesome speaker, so I think you guys should really enjoy it. Okay, cool. Um, see you guys.